you know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the third part of What If Deku Learns Under the Batman. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. The attack on the USJ left everyone shaken. The phones rang off the hook from reporters, parents and concerned citizens, demanding to speak to Nezu or anyone who could tell them why the kids in their charge were in such danger. Reports about the incident in the League of Villains were on every news channel, magazine, and web forum available. Over 72 villains were arrested after the attack, but they were all low-level thugs or petty criminals, and they all said they were approached by Shigaraki and Kirajiri and told they would be paid handsomely to help them kill All Might and a few school kids. None of them had ever heard of their benefactors before nor knew anything about their whereabouts. In the conference room back at UA High, Principal Nezu, All Might, Vlad King, Snipe, and Midnight were all listening to the report presented by Detective Naomasa Tsukachi who was assigned to the case. We've been doing everything we can to find something on this so-called League of Villains, he said. We've made some progress, but can't find anything on this Shigaraki so far. We've searched our records for men in their 20 seconds and 30 seconds registered with some sort of disintegration quirk. But so far we've come up empty. Same for the warp villain, Kirajiri. Our conclusion is that they are not citizens or they are using aliases. Hard to find, either way. So what you're really saying is that we don't know anything. Huffed Vlad King. We've got to track them down, said Snipe. I shot their ringleader, but once he heals up he'll try pulling something like this again. What a pain. He did seem like the type, said All Might, more to himself. Is something on your mind, All Might? Said Nezu. The attack on the USJ was too bold, said All Might. No sane adult would ever attempt it. The ringleader kept monologuing about why he was there. He bragged about Namu's many quirks, but never said a word about his own powers. When things didn't go his way, he was visibly upset, like he was going to throw a tantrum. All Might leaned back and sighed. I guess bragging about Namu's quirks was a quick way to draw me into a fight, he admitted. That might be true, said Nezu. But strategically it was foolish to reveal his quirks up front instead of keeping them a secret. Shigaraki made wild, immature claims, All Might continued. But he did so with a straight face, for the most part and he talked about Namu like it was some kind of a pet. It seemed like he had never been told no before and like he thought things would go his way no matter what. He has the personality of a spoiled little brat, a man-child. A child with incredible power, though, said Vlad King. What worries me, continued Detective Tsukachi, is that this man-child got them all to follow his crazy plan. They viewed him as a real leader. There is nothing more dangerous than a villain with a cause, said a gruff voice. The teachers turned to see the dark form of Batman standing in the doorway. Hiya, Batsy, said Midnight, immediately batting her eyelashes. Come to see little Almy. What are you doing here? Said All Might. Batman has been brought in as a consultant, of sorts, said Tsukachi. He will be helping us in the investigation of the League of Villains. You can't be serious. I'm afraid so, All Might, replied Tsukachi. Batman's forensic and deductive reasoning are unmatched. He has closed more criminal cases than any other hero agency, and has on more than one occasion been cited as the world's greatest detective. Not to mention his ward, Izuku Midoriya, was one of the students involved in the USJ attack, so this case involves him as well. I guess that makes sense, said Vlad King. Criminals are starting to feel more pressure now that the world is brimming with heroes, said Batman. It's not hard to see why they backed such a simple-minded attack. But you are not seeing the big picture. And what is that, Bruce? Said All Might. This was an attempt on your life, said Batman. That was Shigaraki's sole desire in this attack. He didn't want to leave the USJ until you arrived. He brought as many hired thugs as he could to help take you down. He wanted to kill the students as a way to break your spirit. He is obsessed with you and wanted to kill you at all costs. That level of hatred for you is more than just criminal nature. This is psychosis. He was counting on his fingers as he went along and paused. And then there's the Namu. This creature was specifically designed with you in mind. Not only did it have your strength and speed, but it had multiple quirks as well. We know that, said All Might. What's your point? It's too much of a coincidence for a creature such as this to have strength and speed to rival yours, said Batman. But to also have quirks that specifically counter your abilities, not to mention multiple quirks at that. 
Is this sounding familiar? All Might swallowed hard. So, I don't believe that this man-child is the one who orchestrated this event, Batman continued. He's much too immature and impulsive. The warp villain even seemed to serve as his handler more than as his subordinate. The Namu is a product of genetic engineering that hasn't been seen since the appearance of Doomsday. More coincidence, and I don't believe in coincidence. You're suggesting that there's a force behind Shigaraki, said Snipe. I'm not suggesting it, said Batman. I know it for a fact. Everything is pointing back to All Might, so it has to be someone with a connection to him. Someone with an axe to grind. It's only going to be a matter of time before this mastermind reveals himself, whether by choice or by force. We need to be prepared. All the teachers glanced at each other anxiously. How do we prepare against something like that midnight began? Batman was gone. He does that, All Might said, rolling his eyes. Do you think we can trust him? Said Vlad King. All Might sighed. I don't. But, I don't think we have any choice. And I have to admit, everything he said makes sense. If anyone can get to the bottom of what's going on with the League of Villains, it's Batman. Izuku sat at his desk, his classmates chatting around him. The school was closed yesterday, the day after the attack on the USJ. They wanted the students to have a little break after facing villainy and almost certain death. Izuku found it impossible to relax, spending his entire day off training at the warehouse. Izuku was angry. He had worked so hard to become ready for UA, pushed himself past his breaking points, but it still wasn't enough. He had only barely survived the villain attack. If Batman, All Might and the other teachers hadn't shown up when they did, the Namu and the villains would have killed them all. He wasn't strong enough to stop them. Despite all his training, he still wasn't strong enough. He tried his best to ignore what he was feeling, to push through them as he trained harder than ever. But All Might's words just continued to ring in his head. Can you be a hero? Not without a quirk. Midoriya. Izuku jumped, shaken from his thoughts. Hiroshima was trying to get his attention. Sorry, he apologized. Did I startle you? No, you're fine, said Izuku. What were you saying? We were just talking about how Batman showed up in a tank, said Kirishima excitedly. That was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, said Sato, and seeing All Might fight that bird guy, that dude was super strong and he still destroyed him. Yes, said Fumikam. The Batman's arsenal, and All Might's strength, they are both a thing of wonder. Attention, said Ida, speed walking to the front of the room. Homeroom class is about to begin. Everyone please stop talking and take your seats. But we're all sitting already. I wonder who's going to be our teacher today, Mina said. I don't know, said Asui. Mr. Aizawa is still in the hospital recovering from his injuries. As if on cue, the door to the classroom opened to reveal a heavily bandaged but otherwise standing Aizawa. He was covered from head to toe in medical wrappings, with both arms encased in casts and suspended by slings. They even wrapped his face in bandages, obscuring it completely. Warning, class, he said sardonically. Mr. Aizawa, said the class in collective surprise. Well, what a pro, said Kiminari. Mr. Aizawa, said Ida, raising his hand. I am glad that you're okay. You call that okay, said Yuraraka. My well-being is irrelevant, said Aizawa as he limped to the front of the class. What's more important is that your fight isn't over yet. Not more bad guys, said Mainta, ducking under his desk. Two little slits opened between his bandages to reveal Aizawa's bloodshot eyes. The UA Sports Festival is coming up. There was a long, silent pause at Aizawa's words, broken by Kirishima standing up and shouting yes. At the top of his lungs, hang on, said Gyro. Is it really a good idea to have the sports festival so soon after the villains snuck inside? They could attack once we're all in the same place, Ajiro agreed. Apparently the administration thinks that this is a good way to show the threat has been handled, and that our school is safer than ever, said Aizawa. Plus, they're beefing up security compared to past years. Several pro heroes will be operating as security detail, and we have received a gracious donation of the latest in security, disaster response and facial recognition technology, courtesy of Wayne Enterprises. He shot Izuku a quick glance. That meant that Batman himself would be ready to spring into action should anyone try to set foot inside the sports festival who shouldn't. This is a huge opportunity for all students at UA, Aizawa continued. It's not something we can cancel because of a few villains. Our sports festival is one of the most widely watched in the entire world. In the past, everyone obsessed over the Olympic Games. But then quirks started appearing. Now the Olympics have been drastically reduced in terms of scale and viewership. For anyone who cares about competition, this is the only tournament that matters. That's right, agreed Yeyarazu. Hero agencies everywhere will be watching. 
This is where you get scouted. Sure, unless you're dead, muttered Minta glumly. Joining a famous hero agency can garner you greater experience and popularity, said Aizawa. That's why the festival matters. If you want to go pro one day, then this event could open that path for you. One chance a year, three chances in a lifetime. No aspiring hero can afford to miss this festival. That means you better not slack off on your training, he added sternly. Class is dismissed. The bell rang for lunch, and the students of Class 1 were beside themselves with excitement about the upcoming sports festival. The villain stuff sucked, sure, said Kirishima, but I'm pumped for these games. We put on a good show and we're basically on the road to being pros, said Siro. We get so few chances, said Fumikam. We have to make the most of this. Deku, Ida, said Yuraka intensely. Let's do our best in the sports festival. Ida was agreeing vehemently, but Izuku was silent. He had been working in his journal all day, not even paying attention to the lectures in class. Hearing about the sports festival had only fueled his already fervent obsession with improving himself. This was a chance to show the world what he could do, even without a quirk. He had to make the most of this. He had to stand out, but he wasn't sure how. He had his utility belt, his tools, his training, but it wasn't enough. He needed something stronger. He needed to be stronger. Deku, said Yuraka. Are you okay? Yeah, said Ida. You look like you're distracted. Huh? Said Izuku. Oh, and fine. Well, maybe a little distracted. Are you worried about the festival? Said Ida. No. Well, yes, I dunno, said Izuku. It's hard to explain. I've been thinking a lot about the villain attack and the festival as well. I wasn't strong enough to really help during the villain attack. I'm trying to think of something that could help me get stronger. You all have amazing quirks that help you stand out, but I don't have anything. Not true, said Ida. You have your training at the hands of Batman, and your various tools will surely give you an advantage. Yeah, Deku, said Yuraka. I saw you take on those villains with Todoroki and Kirishima. You were amazing. I guess, said Izuku, unconvinced. Whenever I need confidence, said Yuraka. I always think back to the reason why I decided to become a hero. My parents have always struggled financially, and I want to help them so they can live the rest of their lives in comfort. You know, I don't think you've ever talked about why you want to become a hero. Maybe it could help you. That's not a bad idea, said Ida. What are your reasons you wanted to become a hero, Midoriya? Izuku hesitated. I haven't told many people about this, he said slowly, turning away. There was someone I admired once. I guess you could say he was my friend. We had known each other for a long time. He was everything I wanted to be. Smart, strong, confident and with a powerful quirk. I remember, said Yuraka. The friend you were talking about on the bus ride to the USJ, right? Yeah, said Izuku. Well, something happened to him. Something I wasn't able to stop. Something no one was able to stop. Izuku trailed off, but Yuraka and Ida understood. I'm sorry, Deku, said Yuraka. It's fine, said Izuku, but there are times I wish he was here. He would have loved it here. And whenever I'm upset or don't know what to do, I always think to myself, what would he do? How would Izuku froze? Midoriya, said Ida. Are you okay? Asked Yuraka worriedly. That's it, Izuku said, smiling. That's it. Izuku turned on his heel and ran down the hallway, leaving Yuraka and Ida standing there confused. He would apologize to them later. Right now he had to get to the support lab. He was so excited. He had found the answer to his problem, and it was all thanks to Kaken. The sports festival. It had been a week since Aizawa had announced the sports festival. Previews and advertisements for the festival had exploded everywhere, reminding Izuku of what he had in store for him. In a way, Izuku found the anxiety he felt about the festival ironic. He had survived ten months Batman's training, grueling fights in the underground, merciless training at the hands of Aizawa, and even a villain attack. But the sports festival was a chance for him to really shine and show those who doubted him that he truly deserved to be where he was. Not just that, but to prove it to himself as well. He just hoped that his trump card would be enough. He had worked tirelessly in the support lab in an attempt to create his newest weapon. It was more powerful and dangerous than any other weapon in his arsenal, and required delicate precision. The festival was in two weeks, and if he stayed on task, it should be finished in time for the festival. But there wouldn't be much time for testing. He supposed that the sports festival itself would make for an adequate field test for the device. If he didn't inadvertently kill anyone, that is, he was going over their schematics when the bell sounded for the end of their study hall. Iraraka, Izuku and Ida were preparing to head to lunch when Iraraka stopped at the door abruptly. It was as if the whole school was standing outside their classroom. They didn't say a word, simply staring at class 1A in hushed silence. Uh, said Iraraka nervously. Why are you all standing outside our classroom? 
Do you have some sort of business with our class? Asked Ida. Why are you blocking our doorway? Said Maito indignantly. I won't let you hold us hostage. Izuku scanned the class. Most of them had looks of fear and anxiety on their faces, as if they were staring into a cage filled with angry tigers. They were obviously here to size up their competition. They were the only class to survive a real villain attack after all. As Izuku stepped forward, the students turned to him, whispering and murmuring. That's him, the quirkless guy. Didn't you hear? He's being sponsored by Batman. Batman? Is he the next Robin? He doesn't look like much. Don't let that fool you, he's really strong. I wonder how many gadgets he has in his utility belt. All right, everyone, said Ida. We all have places to be. Please let us through. So this is Class 1A, said a drawling voice from the crowd. A student stepped forward to the front of the horde. He had wavy purple hair that stood straight upward. His eyes had deep shadows under them, as if he hadn't slept in days. He strongly reminded Izuku of Aizawa. I heard you guys were impressive, he continued. But after looking at you I'm sad to find you're just a bunch of egomaniacs. I wanted to be in the hero course too, but like many others here I was forced to choose a different path. Such is life. The student turned his gaze towards Izuku, looking him up and down. The whole school is talking about you, he said. How you somehow got into the course without a quirk. You even had a sponsorship from one of the biggest pro heroes in the world. It must be nice to have such connections to take you places. That's not fair, said Uraraka angrily. Izuku has proved himself time and again that he deserves to be here. If you say so, said the student, shrugging. But fancy gadgets and gizmos can only provide a showy front. Without them, are you really as strong as you think you are? Izuku didn't answer, but didn't avert his gaze either. The student stared back at him, as if he wanted Izuku to answer him. Eventually, he turned back to the class. I didn't cut it the first time around, but now I have another chance. If any of us do well in the sports festival the teachers can transfer us to the hero course, and they'll have to transfer people out to make room. I'm here to let you know that if you don't bring your very best, I'll steal your spot right from under you. Consider this a declaration of war. Some of the students in class want to glance about nervously. The student returned his glaring gaze to Izuku. He didn't feel threatened by this declaration of war. Instead, Izuku couldn't help but feel his interest piqued. This student exuded confidence and determination, more so than any of the other students before him. Izuku had no doubt that this student had a powerful quirk, and wondered what the reason could be he was not accepted into the hero program. Hey you, shouted another voice. Izuku and the others turned to see an animated student with a fierce look on his face running towards them. He had sharp teeth and wavy silver hair. His eyes were intense and sharp. I'm from class 1B next door to you, he said loudly. He spoke quickly and angrily, looking at Izuku as if he just stepped in his dinner. He continued on his theory about how class 1 are arrogant and egotistical, but Izuku tuned him out. People seemed to really hate them, despite the fact they almost lost their lives barely a week ago. It was as if they were being blamed for being attacked by the villains. More than that, as the purple-haired student had demonstrated, people still couldn't fully believe in the possibility of a quirkless hero. Once again, Izuku's talents and abilities were being overshadowed by the fact that he didn't have a quirk. He had just about enough of it. He didn't care about sponsors, fame or notoriety. He had one goal for the sports festival, and only one, to show the world that the powerless can be powerful. It was the morning of the festival. The stadium outside the school was packed to bursting with people. Pro heroes from all over the country were there, reporters, local celebrities, vendors, fans and enthusiasts, all chomping at the bit for a taste of what awaited them within the stadium walls. The students of UA had trained tirelessly. This was the chance of a lifetime for them to showcase their skills. Pro heroes in training hoping for an internship at an agency support students looking to showcase their creations for the various companies in attendance. General education students aiming for scholarships into the colleges of their choice. Even the business students were taking advantage of the situation by selling various UA merchandise and swag. This was the place where dreams came true. Izuku and his classmates were all waiting in the Class 1 awaiting room. There they were able to change into their gym uniforms and prepare for the first events. Aw oh man, said Ishido glumly. I was really hoping I could wear my costume. At least everyone will be in uniforms, said Ajiro. That will keep things fair, right? What about you, Midoriya? Asked Kirishima excitedly. What kind of gadgets are you going to be using today? Izuku had thought long and hard about this. He had to fill out a form a couple of weeks ago detailing the support items he was going to be using. He had his secret weapon, but he didn't want to use it too early in the festival. He had been wrestling with the desire to keep his utility belt, 
But the words of that purple-haired student kept echoing in his head. Fancy gadgets and gizmos can only provide a showy front. Without them, are you really as strong as you think you are? He was standing in front of his locker, holding his belt in his hand. Yuraka came up beside him. Are you okay? She asked, concerned. I'm fine, said Izuku. You shouldn't let what that boy said rattle you, Yuraka said. After everything you have done and been through with us, you deserve to be here just as much as the rest of us. Izuku looked back at his utility belt. But what if he's right? He asked. What if all I am is just a bunch of showy gadgets? How is that any different from using a quirk? Asked Shoji. What do you mean? Each of us were gifted with different abilities, Shoji explained. But most people tend to think that having a great quirk makes you unstoppable. But in reality, it often causes them to over-rely on their quirks. Eventually, that catches up to them. He walked over to Izuku, placing a hand upon his shoulder. I have seen you in combat, Midoriya. Your abilities are not limited to what is in that belt. You have the innate ability to think on your feet, to strategize and to use your environment around you to your advantage, no matter the situation. These are the skills that are going to help you in this festival. Izuku felt as if an immense weight was lifted off his shoulders. Thank you, Shoji, said Izuku. Shoji nodded and returned to his locker to finish preparing. I wonder what they have in store for us during the first round, said Sato nervously. No matter what they've prepared for us, we must persevere, said Fumikage. All right, everyone, said Ida, coming through the door. Get your game faces on, we're entering the arena soon. The students all began their preparations. Minda stood next to Izuku, chanting swallow your fear to himself. Izuku had felt much more confident now after Shoji's words and wrapped his utility belt around his waist. He was ready. Midoriya, came a voice from behind him. Izuku turned to see Todoroki approaching him. What's up, Todoroki? Said Izuku. Todoroki looked Izuku up and down. I think that from an objective standpoint, it's fairly clear that I'm stronger than you, he said bluntly. Is that so? Said Izuku. Last time we battled, you caught me off guard, Todoroki continued. That won't happen again. I see, Izuku said. I have noticed that All Might has taken a strong interest in you, said Todoroki. I won't pry as to what's going on between you two. Just know that I will beat you. What's with all these declarations of war? Said Kiminari. Yeah, what's the big deal? Said Kirishima, placing his hand on Todoroki's shoulder. Why are you picking a fight all of the sudden? We're not here to be each other's friends, said Todoroki, knocking Kirishima's hand away. Don't forget, this isn't a team effort. He turned and began to walk away. Izuku felt his anger boil deep inside him. Nice monologue, Todoroki, said Izuku. Now you listen to this, I don't know what you've got going through your head. And you're right, you do have more power than me. In fact, you probably have more potential than anyone in this room. But it wasn't luck or chance that I was able to beat you last time. You believed that your power made you unstoppable, and in your hubris I was able to exploit your weakness. I expect better from you, Todoroki. You better come at me with everything you've got because I'm coming for you, and I won't hold back this time. Todoroki stared back at Izuku, his face passive, but his eyes intense. Fine, he said simply and walked away. Fireworks exploded above the stadium. The crowd of observers were cheering in exponential exuberance. The UA Sports Festival was about to begin. Welcome back to the UA Sports Festival. Present Mike's voice blasted over the PAS systems, although it was debatable whether or not he really needed them. Where up-and-coming heroes leave everything on the field as they fight for the chance to achieve worldwide fame and celebrity. This first group are no strangers to the spotlight. You know them for withstanding a villain attack. The dazzling students lighting up your TVs with solid gold skills. The hero core students of Class 1A. Izuku and his classmates marched onto the field. He took a moment to gaze around him as he walked, taking in the sheer amount of people in the stands. He knew there would be a lot, but he was still taken aback at their numbers. I hope we are still able to give our best performances despite all these eyes watching us, said Ida. I suppose it's just one of the aspects of being a hero we all have to get used to. Present Mike continued to introduce the rest of the courses, Hero Course Class 1B, General Studies Classes C, D, and E, Support Classes F, G, and H, and Business Classes I, J, and K. They all approached the introduction podium where Midnight was waiting for them. A few of the students commented about her revealing apparel and whether or not it was appropriate for a school. Now, the introductory speech, shouted Midnight, cracking her nine tails whip. And for the student pledge, we have she turned and faced Izuku directly. Izuku Midoriya. Izuku felt his stomach drop to his feet. They chose him to be their representative. Of all people, why him? Was this a publicity stunt because he was the first quirkless student to ever attend the UA Hero course? He must have been frozen in contemplation for a while because he was nudged forward by Ida. 
His legs were shaking as he slowly approached the podium. He could hear the other students murmur and question among themselves as to the teacher's choice for their representative. The stadium went deathly quiet as he reached the microphone. Izuku could feel himself being crushed by the weight of every single eye on him. Izuku cleared his throat. Um, he said. He looked at his classmates. Yuraraka and Ida were all giving him encouraging looks. He desperately racked his brain for anything to say. He was blowing it. He was. Something out of the corner of his eye caught his attention. Up in the VIP box, behind midnight, sat two familiar faces that Izuku recognized instantly. An elderly man in an expensive pinstripe suit and bow tie, sporting a green foam finger and holding a sign that read Izuku Midoriya, the next number one. And next to him was a tall, handsome man with a gaunt expression that Izuku knew only too well. Bruce and Alfred. Izuku barely suppressed a laugh. He felt the anxiety drain away, a new confidence flowing through him. He wasn't sure if they would have made it, and they were even there with a few people that Izuku didn't recognize. A tall, younger man with long black hair and a charming smile, and a beautiful young woman in a wheelchair, both who were also cheering him on. The hum, Midnight said, nodding towards the microphone. Izuku nodded, smiling. If you would have told me I would be where I'm standing now only a year ago, Izuku said. I would have laughed in your face. The first quirkless student ever to be accepted into the hero course at UA. Someone I once looked up to, someone I admired as a hero, once told me that I couldn't be a hero without a quirk. But then someone else came along, someone who believed in me, who helped me get to where I am today, and told me something that has always encouraged me, you, Izuku Midoriya, will become a hero, that I promise. So to anyone here who is like me, who is told by others that their dreams are unrealistic, you simply tell them Izuku raised his fist into the air. Go beyond. Plus Ultra. The crowd erupted in thundering applause. Izuku returned to his class, and he was besieged by cheers, pats on the back and shoulders, and even a hug from Yuraraka. Without further ado, said Midnight, it's time for us to get started. The obstacle course. Without further ado, it's time to get things started. Shouted Midnight into the microphone. This is where you begin feeling the pain. She raised her nine tails whip upward and a large jumbotron screen appeared behind her. The first fateful game of the festival, she said. What could it be? A large spinning object appeared on the screen, and the students waited for it to reveal their fates. After about ten seconds, it abruptly stopped. Their first challenge was an obstacle course. All eleven classes will participate in this treacherous contest, said Midnight, the screen behind her outlining the course. The track is four kilometers around outside of the stadium. I don't want to restrain anyone, at least in this game, she added slyly, licking her lips. As long as you don't leave the course, you're free to do whatever your heart desires. Now then, take your place contestants. The students all piled around towards the gate that led outside to the course. Izuku readied himself as he nervously watched the clock count down. 3. Bruce, Izuku thought. I know you picked me for a reason. 2. I'm not sure I completely know what those reasons are. 1. But I will make you proud. Begin. The students scrambled like a herd of spooked cattle towards the gate opening. As they got closer, the students began to smash and bump into each other, trying to push past towards the other end of the gate. Izuku hesitated before entering as all the students scratched, pushed, pulled and yelled themselves through. They're testing us, Izuku thought immediately. They're trying to see how we get through. A wave of ice erupted in the cramped space of the gate. Students slipped and slid, others found themselves stuck as the ground beneath them was frozen solid. Todoroki had obviously came to the same conclusion as Izuku, and was attempting to hinder the other's progression. Izuku wouldn't be so easy to stop. Leaping quickly to avoid the ice, Izuku pulled his grapple hook from his belt and fired upward. The hook embedded itself in the roof of the gateway, and Izuku was launched upward. Surveying his surroundings, he saw that Todoroki had already pulled ahead, while several other students, notably most of them from his class, were close behind him. Izuku even noticed the purple-haired student being carried through the ice by four other students. Izuku released the clamp of the grapple gun and launched it forward, latching onto the ground next to Todoroki. Izuku was propelled forward, but Todoroki must have noticed the grapple claw landing next to him, as he quickly froze the line solid, snapping it off from the claw. Izuku was propelled forward by the momentum of the grapple line, but stopped short onto the ice below. Thinking quickly, Izuku tumbled in air and landed on his feet, allowing the ice to carry him the rest of the way. Nice try, Todoroki, thought Izuku. Todoroki looked up as he saw Minta leaping towards him, having launched the sticky balls on his head onto the ice and using them to springboard him forward. He was preparing to throw one directly at Todoroki when he was smacked across the face by a long, metal object. 
The students stopped short as before them was a wall of at least a dozen villain robots, the same robots from the entrance exam, including several of the zero pointers. Todoroki wasted no time, placing a frozen hand on the ground and freezing the zero point robots solid. He stopped the robots, said one of the students. Look, we can get through the legs, shouted another. As they began to proceed, the zero-point robots began to wobble precariously. Izuku immediately knew what was going on. Todoroki purposefully froze the robots so they would be off balance. In seconds they would come crashing down, which would hinder the other students' progress further. But the force from the robots falling would cause a massive shockwave, and the other students could get hurt in the process. Izuku couldn't let that happen. He reached into his belt and pulled out three explosive batarangs, one for each robot. He had upped the explosive power on them since his fight with the Namu, but he hoped it would be enough. With lightning speed, he threw each of them towards the falling robots, each one sticking in their giant, red optic sensor. The explosion knocked each of the robots backwards with tremendous force, sending them crashing down towards Todoroki. Startled, Todoroki quickly used his ice around him to protect himself from the shockwave. Whoa, came the voice of present Mike from the speakers overhead. Todoroki had pulled ahead with a devastating display of power, but Midoriya has completely countered him with a fantastic move of his own. These two are the ones to watch, it almost seems unfair, thoughts. Todoroki's attack was both offensive and defensive, came the muffled voice of Aizawa from the speakers. But Midoriya's attack seemed to be almost completely defensive. With his skills, he could have easily pulled forward and left the others to fend for themselves. Instead he sacrificed time to stop the robots from falling forward, perhaps out of fear of them injuring others. Interesting. Midoriya doesn't seem to know the meaning of competition, said present Mike. Or perhaps he doesn't care, said Aizawa. In any case, these robot villains certainly don't stand a chance against these students' chart-topping moves, said present Mike. The smaller robots began to form up around the students in the wake of the zero pointers. While the others balked at their approach, Izuku pushed forward. Reaching into his utility belt, he pulled out more explosive batarangs, throwing them towards a one and three point robot. They exploded on impact destroying the two robots. A two point robot moved toward him, but Izuku was too fast for it. Sliding under its spider-like body, he pulled his explosive gel from his belt and sprayed it along the bottom of its belly. After reaching the other side, he pressed the detonator, and the robot exploded, its broken parts flying all over the course. The other students fought their way through more robots that began to converge on them. Izuku continued on. Up in the teacher's box, the UA staff watched the ensuing chaos below closely. Looks like all the pack leaders are from Class 1A, said Snipe. At least for now. It's not that 1B and the other students are doing poorly, said All Might. It's just that 1A has learned not to hesitate. They've seen what the real world is like. They've felt the fear of facing villains. Yet they fight on, trying to overcome that fear. They've all grown. Especially Midoriya, said 13. He seems as unstoppable as Todoroki. Batman trained him well. All Might had to admit, 13 was right. Midoriya was performing way above expectations, as usual. He was swift, strong, and was thinking on his feet. But it was more than that. Every other student on that field was looking out for number one. Everyone except him. He knew that the students were in danger from those falling robots. Instead of using that to his advantage to pull ahead, he chose to put them out of harm's way. Placing others ahead of yourself, thought All Might. The mark of a true hero. He looked down towards the VIP box, where he knew Bruce and his family to be sitting. He quietly gasped in surprise as he did. Bruce was staring directly at him, turning away. All Might tried to pretend he didn't notice, but he knew it was futile. Bruce was sending him a message, one he read all too loud and clear. You are wrong. For those of you who thought the first obstacle was easy, said present Mike over the speakers. Let's see how you feel about the second one. Standing before the students was a great chasm that dropped at least 50 feet down. Within the chasm were narrow, flat-topped butts and pillars, all connected together at the top by strands of rope. When did they even have time to build something like this? Said Yuraka exasperatedly. Without a word, Asui crouched down and launched herself forward, landing easily on one of the connecting ropes. A pink-haired student from one of the support courses stepped forward. This is the perfect chance to show off what I can do, she said gleefully. She launched a grapple line from a harness-like device she was wearing, the hook landing several pillars away. Without hesitation, flipped a switch on her boots, which began to emanate a loud humming sound, and leaped off of the edge and into the chasm. Her boots grapple harness pulled her forward while her boots appeared to slow her initial fall and control her ascension. Iroraka was floored by this student's lack of hesitation. Gritting her teeth, she ran forward towards the chasm. 
I won't lose, she said as she leaped forward. Todoroki slid easily across the ice ropes towards the other side of the chasm. He had lost track of Midoriya, but he had no doubt that he wasn't far behind, so he dared not stop, even to catch his breath. As if on cue, three batarangs flew past his head and embedded themselves in the ground in front of him, causing him to stop abruptly. Midoriya was running across the ropes quicker than an acrobat on a tightrope. He had thrown the batarangs, not with the intention of hitting Todoroki, but as a message. His eyes burned with a fiery intensity that burned into the depths of Todoroki's soul, his words echoing inside his ear, I'm coming for you. And now, we're finally approaching the last obstacle, said present Mike. Everyone had better tread carefully, you're stepping onto a minefield. Todoroki approached the edge of an open dirt field between two giant signs that read danger. Mines. There were hundreds of circles grouped closely together, with not much space between them but a couple of footsteps. Todoroki couldn't risk using his eyes to make a path. It would give the other students behind him a way over as well. He had to admit this was clever, it put those in the lead at a disadvantage. He carefully made his way through the minefield as explosions went off around him, students being flown through the air for their carelessness. All except for one. Todoroki looked back in shock as he saw Izuku running swiftly through the minefield. His eyes were dashing back and forth between the ground and ahead, but his step had not slowed. He was approaching Todoroki quickly. Todoroki had no choice. He formed an ice path at his feet. It would end up helping the others, but there was no time to worry about them. Izuku and Todoroki were neck and neck, rushing towards the finish line. In desperation, Todoroki grabbed Izuku by the arm, with frost quickly forming on it. Izuku leaped aside, avoiding more mines, continuing to run. They were almost at the end of the field. Izuku leaped into the air, catching Todoroki off guard. He purposefully landed atop a mine directly in front of him. The mine exploded, throwing Todoroki off his feet and launching Izuku forward into the air. He flipped gracefully and landed on his feet into a full sprint. Todoroki regained his footing and rushed after him, but it was already too late. Izuku had reached the stadium. The race was over. Izuku Midoriya is our champion. Present Mike bellowed over the speakers. The crowd roared with applause and cheers. Confetti dropped all around Izuku who bent down on one knee, catching his breath. He looked up towards the VIP box, where Alfred, the long-haired man and the woman in the wheelchair cheered furiously. Bruce remained his regular stoic self, but offered him an approving smile and nod. The highest of compliments, Izuku had done it. He won the first event, the cavalry battle, three days ago. It's good to see you my friend. An old man was sitting at a small, round table eating fish-shaped pastries. The man was short and aged. A scraggly gray beard hung down from his grizzled face. He wore a yellow spandex suit with a long cape to match. A black domino mask stretched across his eyes. Across from him sat a tall, handsome man in a black suit, enjoying a cup of coffee provided by his host. Likewise, Gran Torino, said Bruce Wayne, smiling. It's been a while since your last visit, said Gran Torino. But you still visit me more than that old student of mine. You two aren't getting along still. I'm afraid not, replied Bruce. Well, I suppose that can't be helped, said Gran Torino. Your personalities are so different, and you're both stubborn as mules, too. He let out a chuckle, taking another bite of the pastry he was holding. So what do I owe this surprise visit? I need your advice. Gran Torino snorted. An old man like me giving advice to the world's greatest detective. Should I be flattered or worried? Worried, said Bruce seriously. As you know, I'm working the League of Villains case. Toshinori mentioned that in his last letter, Gran Torino confirmed. I'm not supposed to be telling you this, but I feel as if you need to know. The police were able to recover the creature called Namu, said Batman. It offered no resistance to arrest and was completely compliant. I participated in the interrogation of the creature myself. After several attempts, it was determined that the Namu can't speak. It shows no reaction to anything. It's as though it literally can't think for itself, no matter what's going on around it. I ran some tests of its DNA and discovered that it was originally a low-level thug with a record of assault and extortion. Originally, said Gran Torino, Bruce pulled a small round device from his pocket. Activating it, a small projection of a prisoner mugshot next to a police picture of the Namu appeared. As you can see, he has been altered drastically, said Batman. This is genetic engineering at an unprecedented level. As I analyzed its genetic makeup, I discovered four people's DNA. Ghastly, said Gran Torino. It's not even human anymore. Bruce nodded grimly. The transformation is a result of drugs and other unknown methods, he said. Why would someone do such a thing, said Gran Torino. 
That's why I came to you, said Bruce. It's been modified so that its body could hold multiple quirks at once. What? Gran Torino said sharply. As you know, it shouldn't have more than one power, said Bruce. Even if new DNA is introduced that shouldn't give a person multiple powers. Bruce hesitated. Not unless it's completely integrated into someone's body. Not all quirks work like one for all. What are you saying, Bruce? Said Gran Torino, even though he didn't want to hear the answer. There is someone out there with the power to pass different quirks on to people, Gran Torino, said Batman. We both know it. Toshinori killed him, said Gran Torino. I saw it myself. Death isn't always as permanent as we once believed, old friend, said Bruce. Gran Torino stood from his chair, steadying himself with his cane. He still vividly remembered that fateful day, five years ago. The sheer weight of 100 years of cultivated power rocked the very earth itself as they clashed. The man who sealed the fate of the symbol of peace to die a slow death, who had killed his mentor and Gran Torino's dear friend. The man who filled his dreams with nightmares to this very day. He was still out there, biding his time, getting stronger, plotting. All for one was still alive. Have you told Toshinori? Asked Gran Torino. No, said Bruce. There's more. What do you mean? Tamura Shigaraki. The man-child. What about him? It regards Nana Shimura, said Bruce. Gran Torino stood in silence, shaken to his very core. Even though he heard Bruce speak the words, he couldn't believe them. My God, he said finally. You can't be serious. I'm always serious, said Bruce. You have to tell Toshinori, said Gran Torino. No, said Bruce firmly. And neither can you. Why not? Because he is going to have to face Shigaraki and all for one again, said Bruce. Knowing will only burden him further, making it harder to do what needs to be done. He has a right to know, said Gran Torino. And he will know, said Bruce. But not right now. I need you to trust me, old friend. Gran Torino sighed deeply. This feels wrong, he said. But I suppose you're right. They sat together in silence for a while. Gran Torino stared at the cold pastries before him. His appetite had soured greatly. He instead turned his attention to Bruce. His handsome face contained more lines than the last time he saw him. In many ways, he wasn't unlike Toshinori. They both carried the weight of the world on their shoulders. Their desire to fight for what they knew was right was unquestioned, and they both would go to the end of time itself to complete their mission. They both knew what it was like to experience great loss as well. I heard about what happened to Jason, said Gran Torino. I'm so sorry, Bruce. Me too, said Bruce solemnly. Thank you. How are you holding up? Bruce didn't answer. Gran Torino understood. He knew the feeling all too well. Toshinori told me in his last letter about your new protege. Midoriya. Izuku Midoriya, yes, said Bruce. Toshinori seems to think you took this kid under your wing just to get under his skin. He would think that. Is he wrong? Not entirely. Gran Torino chuckled. You think he's ready for the sports festival? I know he is, said Bruce. Well then, said Gran Torino. This should be an event to remember. Izuku hunched over, hands on knees, catching his breath. He was used to extreme physical exertion, but even he was taxed by that obstacle course. Izuku looked over to Todoroki who was heading to the podium with the other students. He's good, very good. He is the son of Endeavor, after all. It was clear that he was already very proficient in the use of his quirk. Izuku couldn't take any chances or underestimate him, or it would cost him. But Izuku knew that something was off about him. There was more to his quirk, and Izuku knew it. He only used his right side when using his ice power. If Izuku's theory was correct, then this meant he was limiting himself. But if that were true, then it also meant that Todoroki was much more powerful than he was leading on. But why was he limiting himself in the first place? Just how powerful was he at full strength? Izuku was brought back to reality by Midnight's projected voice at the podium. 42 of you qualified to move on to the next round, she said, the display on the Jumbotron spinning once again. Gird your loins and prepare for your next test. The display stopped spinning, revealing the next event to be. Cavalry battle, said Midnight, cracking her nine tails whip. Those of you who are at the top will suffer the most. Of course, that's something you'll hear over and over again at UA. Show us what plus ultra means. She snapped her whip in Izuku's direction. Izuku Midoriya placed first in the qualifier. He'll be worth 10 million points. Izuku felt his heart drop to his feet. A cavalry battle was an event where four people, acting as the horse, carried a fifth person on their shoulders. Who was the rider? The rider wore a bandana around their head that signified how many points they were worth. If the other team's rider managed to snatch the bandana off their head, they inherited those points. That meant that Izuku was worth 10 million points. In essence, anyone who takes him down secures their victory. Izuku once again felt the weight of every eye pressing down on him, this time with an intense fury that burned him to his core. He never felt like more of a target than he did now. 
he supposed that this was the burden of being the best. Everyone was always gunning for you, be they friend or foe. He never expected to feel anything like this. It's ironic. A small part of his mind mused. I've always wanted to be a hero, but I've never wanted to be in the spotlight. A pro hero's career practically depends on gaining the spotlight. How do people manage it? How does Bruce? Izuku turned to look at the VIP box. Bruce was staring directly at him. Izuku could almost feel their minds connecting, with Bruce's words passing through his mind. A hero's duty is to the mission, stopping villains, protecting innocent lives. It's all the same, he had said. Nothing else matters. Notoriety, fame, money, all the things that drive heroes these days do not matter. It serves only as a distraction, and when a hero is distracted, people die. Remember this, Izuku. Izuku steadied his breath. Remember the mission, he thought to himself. The mission is to win. Now, you've got 15 minutes to build your teams, shouted Midnight. I recommend you get started. Izuku was faced with a challenge. Since he had so many points, everyone would be gunning for him. People didn't want to partner up with someone had such a target as he did on their backs, so finding partners for something so risky was going to be difficult. The students around him were quickly forming teams. Soon there wouldn't be anyone left if he didn't move. Deku, Izuku turned to see Uraraka running towards him. Let's team up, she said happily. Are you sure? Said Izuku. Everyone's going to be gunning for me since my points are so high. After all I've seen you do, I have faith in you, she said. We're gonna win. All right, said Izuku. But we need a few more. He and Uraraka approached Ida. He listened as Izuku explained their plan emphasizing evasion and utilizing Uraraka's quirk and Izuku's tech. With Ida's speed no one would be able to touch them. A good plan, said Ida. But I'm sorry, I'm afraid I must refuse your offer. What? Izuku and Uraraka said, shocked. Since this all started, I've been losing to you, said Ida. Please don't take this as an insult. You're a great friend. But if I continue to follow you, I'll never get stronger. Todoroki may have challenged you already, but he isn't the one who sees you as a rival and I will try my best to defeat you. As much as it pained him to lose him as an ally, Izuku had to respect his reason for it. They were all here to get stronger, and this was going to be the ultimate test for him as well, the powerless versus the powerful. It was time to show them what he was really made of. M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A Came a voice from the crowd. Running up to him was the pink-haired support student from the first event who used her gadgets to move her through the fall. Hatsum, said Izuku. You know her, said Uraraka. The name is Mei Hatsum, said the girl. I'm from the support class. I was hoping that you didn't have a team yet. With you in the spotlight, this is the perfect opportunity to show off my cute babies to the CEOs of support companies tuning into the festival. By the way, why haven't you used the one we were working on yet? She added to Izuku crossly. I don't want to use it too early on, said Izuku quickly. I have a feeling I'll need it later. What are you talking about? Said Uraraka suspiciously. What were you working on? Just a little something to even the odds, said Izuku. Well, whatever, said Hatsum, placing a large chest she was carrying on the ground. She opened it to reveal that it was stuffed to the brim with different support items and other various kinds of tech. I packed a ton of powerful babies to bring with me. I'm sure you'll find something you like in my arsenal. Izuku reached into the chest and pulled out what looked like a jetpack. I recognize this, said Izuku. This is based off Air Jet, the Buster Hero's jetpack, isn't it? That's right, said Hatsum. Izuku and Hatsum continued discussing the tech and the different heroes she gained inspiration from. They sure get along, thought Uraraka sourly. We still need one more, said Izuku, looking throughout the crowd. Most of the teams had already been formed. Losing Ida was a definite blow, but he still had an idea of someone who might help him if he hadn't already been selected. Izuku found his target and walked with determination towards him, placing his hand upon his shoulder. Join me. I see, said Takoyami. An excellent strategy. Will you join us? Asked Izuku. Takoyami paused. When I first learned about you, Midoriya, I was surprised to see that they let a quirkless student into the top school in the country. I've heard that before, said Izuku. Then I saw you in combat. Takoyami continued. The legend of the Batman was my inspiration to become a hero as well. A hero who shuns the spotlight, a master of the darkness. He extended his hand, clasping Izuku's. I will join you, son of Batman. A blasting horn sounded, signaling that the time for selecting teams was up. Oh goody, said Midnight. It's time to get this party started. Izuku placed his bandana on his head. Taking a deep breath, he surveyed the field before him. Every student was squared to face them. This was it. Are you ready? Izuku said. Uraraka, ready. Hatsum, you got it. Takoyami, yes. Then let's do this. Let's get this party started. 
shouted Present Mike. One final countdown before the time starts. Takoyami called Dark Shadow. Izuku straightened his utility belt. The students readied themselves as Present Mike began the countdown. 3. 2. Point 1. Todoroki and Izuku stared each other down. His eyes burned with both a fiery intensity and a cold chill. Begin. The students all immediately began rushing towards Izuku and his team. They're not even giving us a chance, huh? Said Takoyami. Such is the fate of the pursuit. Make your choice, Midoriya. Everyone, shut your eyes and hold your breath. Shouted Izuku. He threw a small orb onto the ground, which exploded in a large cloud of smoke that covered them all. The students all balked in surprise. One of the students used their quirk and blew the smoke away. Izuku and his team were gone. What the? Came present Mike's voice. Where did they go? Up there, shouted one of the students, pointing skyward. Izuku and his team were floating in the air. Yuraka had used her quirk to make them lightweight, while Izuku used the jetpack on his back to lift them upward. Gyro, now, shouted Hagakure. Gyro extended her plug-like ear lobes towards Izuku and the others. But Dark Shadow was too fast for her, knocking them effortlessly out of the way. Good work, said Takoyami. Please continue to watch our blind spots Dark Shadow. You're all doing great, said Izuku. Let's keep it up. Yuraka, using the hover boots designed by Hatsum, directed them towards an empty piece of land away from the other students. The field was pandemonium. After witnessing Takoyami and Yuraraka's quirks and Hatsum and Izuku's gadgets, many teams decided against pursuing Izuku and went after the smaller point teams instead. One in particular was Monomo, a hero student from Class 1B. He and his team were moving quickly throughout the field, picking the smaller point headbands off one by one. Aside from Izuku, Class 1A was not doing so well points-wise. They were more interested in going for the whole schmear, Izuku's 10 million points. We need some breathing room, said Takoyami as several of the groups began to converge on their position. We can't get caught trapped between multiple opponents. Izuku turned to see Shoji running at them at full sprint. He seemed to be alone, but he would be on them in seconds. Let's get moving, said Izuku. But Yuraraka didn't move. I'm stuck, she said, trying to lift her foot. Izuku looked down to see the hoverboot was stuck to the ground with one of Minta's sticky balls. But Minta was nowhere in sight. He looked back at Shoji. His tentacle arms were extended upwards, the membranes between them forming some sort of a protective tent. Poking his eye out between the gaps of Shoji's front arms was none other than Minta. He was wearing his team's headband, and was small enough to ride on Shoji's back while being protected by his arms. Izuku had to admit it was clever. Meneta disappeared inside Shoji's protective tent, and a long, pink tongue extended outward towards Izuku, who moved his head just seconds before it connected, missing him by inches. So Asui is in there too, thought Izuku. They were stuck, and Asui's reach with her tongue was a problem. He would have to think fast. Takoyami, cover me, said Izuku. It's time to fight Sticky with Sticky. Dark Shadow began protecting Izuku's flank as he pulled a capsule from his belt. The threw at Shoji, who dodged it effortlessly. Not so fast, Midoriya, said Shoji. I saw you use that glue capsule during training. I won't fall for it like Ida. That wasn't glue, said Izuku, pressing on a detonator. The capsule behind Shoji exploded, launching him and his team forward. As they flew towards them, Izuku threw another capsule, which landed squarely on Shoji's chest. The capsule erupted in a sticky ooze, entrapping Shoji and his arms inside it from the neck down, but trapping Asui and Minta as well. Whoa, said present Mike, Midoriya displaying his cunning sleight of hand, nearly knocking team Shoji off balance, but entraping them instead. Is that even allowed? They didn't get knocked over, said Midnight. So technically yes, that's a dirty trick, shouted Minta, throwing as many sticky balls as he could. Asui tried again to use her tongue to get Izuku's headband. We need to get out of their range, said Izuku. He activated the jetpack, which struggled to take them off the ground as Yuraraka's boot was still stuck with Minta's sticky ball. After a loud crunch the boot was pulled free. My baby's ruined, shouted Hatsum in despair. Sorry, said Izuku, but at least we got away. Nice work, Yuraraka. It's hard to control with just one boot, said Yuraraka. Understood, said Izuku. That meant their maneuverability was greatly hindered. It was too risky for them to take to the sky again. They were grounded. They had to now rely on Takoyami's dark shadow and Yuraraka's zero gravity. But Izuku also had a few more tricks up his sleeve. A giant wall of ice cut suddenly through Izuku's path. Todoroki was back. Izuku had to confess he had almost forgotten about him. But now he was out for blood. Midoriya, he said. I'll be taking the bendana now. I didn't think this confrontation would happen until later in the contest, said Takoyami. 
He seems to have it out for you, Midoriya. I get that a lot, said Izuku. The game's only halfway over. We can't stop now. Forward, Ida, said Todoroki. Ida, carrying Todoroki in front, pushed forward at incredible speed, with Kaminari and Yeyorazu carrying their rider behind him. Several other students were rushing Izuku's team in turn as well. Eiyurazu created a large tarp from her exposed midsection, which Todoroki used to cover himself and his team. Kaminari then unleashed a blast of electricity that shocked the other students around them. While reeling from the shock, Todoroki used his ice to freeze the ground beneath the other contestants, immobilizing them. Now he had a clear shot at Izuku. Will you look at that? said present Mike. He stopped all those teams cold in their tracks. But only after Kaminari immobilized them with his electricity, said Aizawa. He's adapting his strategy. Todoroki was snatching headbands off the other students as he went along. His points continued to climb. He threw up another large wall of ice between himself and the other students, separating his and Izuku's team from everyone else. It was just them now. They were reaching them at great speed due to Ida's quirk. They would be on them in seconds. Izuku tried to activate the jetpack, but it was malfunctioning. Dark Shadow attempted to push them back, but Yeyorazu threw up a large shield, protecting them. I have an idea, said Ida, but it will leave me useless to you for a while. Be ready to get that headband. Ida's engines roared with fury. Reciproburst. With blinding speed that rivaled the Namu, Ida raced his team forward, and Todoroki snatched the headband right off Izuku. They were now in the lead. We have to get that headband back, said Izuku. But be careful of Yeyorazu. No, we need to be careful about Kaminari, said Takoyami. If there had been any more sunlight, his electricity could completely destroy Dark Shadow. Sunlight, that gave Izuku an idea. Takoyami, recall Dark Shadow, said Izuku. What? said Takoyami. Just do it. Takoyami complied. What are they doing? thought Todoroki. Are they giving up, now that we have their head bent? Everyone, avert your eyes, shouted Izuku. He threw a large device from his belt towards the other team. Ida slowed to avoid hitting it. Remember being trapped in the glue from the training session. But upon hitting the ground, the device exploded in a blinding flash of light. I can't see, shouted Ida, coming to a stop. Flashman grenade, said Todoroki, trying to get his senses back. There were only 11 seconds left. They had to keep hold of their headband. He was about to place it on his neck with the others when he heard Midoriya's voice. Now, Takoyami, call forth Dark Shadow and get the headband. Todoroki felt heat as his left arm burst into flame. What am I doing? He thought, horrified. He never used his left side in battle. Was it a desperate attempt to keep the bandana from being taken? His vision began to clear, but was still blurry, but he saw a dark figure lunging towards him. He reached out with his left arm to shield himself, still ablaze and clutching the 10 million point headband. The figure knocked his arm aside, exposing his chest. Seconds later, he felt something latch onto the headbands around his neck and were torn away. The buzzer sounded. Time was up. Todoroki's sight finally cleared. He looked at the 10 million point headband he was still holding, but the rest of the bandanas around his neck were gone. He looked at Midoriya, who was holding his grapple hook with the bandanas clutched in the claw. He began to understand. While they were blinded, Takoyami had used Dark Shadow to try and get the 10 million point headband. Instead it just knocked his hand away, which opened his guard. Midoriya then used the grapple gun to take the rest of the headbands around his neck. They weren't worth as much, but they still made up at least 2,000 points. That meant that Midoriya and this team came in second. Todoroki and his team had won. Todoroki leaped down to the ground. He stared at his left arm. He had used his left side in battle out of desperation, something he swore he would never do. Damn, he thought bitterly. The victory felt so hollow. At this rate, I'll end up exactly as he wants me to be. The second event came to an end. Todoroki's team was in first, with Izuku's team in second, and Shinso, the purple-haired student from the general studies course, in third, with several other groups going down the ranks from there. The games were put on intermission while the contestants went to lunch. The students were all catching up, some of them cursing their performance in the games, others congratulating their peers. Hey, Yuroraka said. Has anyone seen Deku? Todoroki stared coldly at Izuku as they stood across each other in the hallway of the faculty and student lounge. Izuku wasn't intimidated easily, but he couldn't help but feel a deep sense of resentment, anger and pain that seemed to reside deep within Todoroki. This was perhaps something that the both of them had in common. You wanted me here, said Izuku. Now what do you want? You wanted me here, said Izuku. Now what do you want? Todoroki continued to glare at Izuku. 
No matter how hard he tried, Izuku couldn't understand why Todoroki hated him so much. It was as if he didn't even care how well he did in the sports festival, so long as he beat Izuku. I don't understand, said Izuku, exasperated. Your little war is over, Todoroki. You won the cavalry battle. Why are you wasting my time? I was overwhelmed, said Todoroki. What? I was overwhelmed. At the end of the cavalry battle, Todoroki explained. And it made me break a promise I made to myself a long time ago. Your fire quirk, said Izuku. I knew there was more to your quirk than you were letting on. Why haven't you used it? It would give you such a huge advantage in these games. Todoroki didn't answer. He pulled his left hand from his pocket, looking at it. I didn't think much of you when I first met you, before the hero, villain training session, said Todoroki. Despite not having a quirk, you were able to beat me. It was more than that, though. You outsmarted me. Then came the incident at the USJ. Despite being woefully outmatched, you were able to take control of the situation and turn it in our favor. What's your point? Said Izuku. You're a student of that American hero, Batman. Todoroki continued. My father always told me that he was just a vigilante nobody. But witnessing you tells me differently. I'm stronger than you, or at least, I should be. On top of that, there's All Might. What do you mean? Said Izuku. I've seen the way you act around him, said Todoroki. You avoid him, yet he tries very hard to talk to you, to get your attention. Why you, out of all of his students, and yet you seem to want nothing to do with him. You look upon him with intense, hatred almost. Again, Todoroki, said Izuku impatiently. What, is, your, point? There is some kind of connection between you and All Might. Are you his son? Asked Todoroki. Izuku stared at Todoroki for a good ten seconds before bursting into laughter. You think I'm his son? Izuku said incredulously. It's nothing like that at all. Why would you even think that? Nothing like that, repeated Todoroki. Interesting choice of words. That suggests that there is something between you two that you're not supposed to talk about. Izuku swallowed. If anything, Todoroki was sharp. You're seeing connections where there are none, he said. Todoroki didn't seem to be listening. You were aware that my father is Endeavor before we even truly met, he said, his eyes narrowing. I don't know how you knew, but if you're connected to the number one hero in some way, that would mean that I have even more reason to beat you. Izuku could hardly believe his ears. It was just like the villain attack at the USJ, except now he personally was being targeted by someone who should be his ally, all for having some small connection to All Might. He was so sick of this he could puke. What do you care of my so-called connection to All Might? Said Izuku. My father is an ambitious man, said Todoroki. He aims to be the best. He used his power to get to where he is now, but he has never been able to best All Might. The symbol of peace is living proof of his failure. He's still at it though, trying to take down All Might, one way or another. What are you getting at? Have you ever heard of quirk marriages? Asked Todoroki. They became a problem in the first few generations after superpowers became widespread. There were those who sought out potential mates solely with the intention of creating powerful children. Many people were forced into relationships. Izuku had heard of this. Eastern countries, Japan in particular, had a history of arranged marriages. For hundreds, even thousands of years, people had been forced into marriages in order to unite kingdoms, for business transactions, or to increase a family's power. When it was discovered that quirks were genetic, it was only a matter of time before people were marrying and breeding to create a dynasty of powerful kin. My father not only has a rich history of his past accomplishments, but plenty of money to throw at his problems, said Todoroki. He bought my mother's relatives to get his hands on her quirk, and now he's raising me to usurp all might. Izuku felt a pang of sympathy for Todoroki. To be born into this world and to have one's selfish ambitions thrust upon you is a tale as old as time. But Izuku was disgusted to learn that something like this could be prevalent in a profession where you are literally described as a hero. Izuku supposed that he shouldn't be surprised, as most people only wanted to become heroes this day, and age to become rich and famous. This never mattered to Izuku. He wanted to be a hero for the sake of being a hero. He wanted to save people, to help those who can't help themselves. The level of corruption to befall Endeavor, the number two hero, over something as pointless as the desire to be the best, made him sick to his stomach. I refuse to be a tool for that scumbag, said Todoroki angrily, more to himself than to Izuku. He raised his hand to the red scar on his face. In every memory of my mother, I can only see her crying. I remember she called my left side unbearable before pouring boiling water on my face. Dear God, thought Izuku, horrified. The reason I picked a fight with you was to show my old man what I was capable of doing, said Todoroki. 
without having to rely on his damn fire quirk. I'm going to show him that I reject his power, and that I'm going to take first place without using it. So that was it. The reason behind his angst and animosity towards Izuku. Endeavor was living vicariously through him in an effort to displace All Might. In doing so he destroyed the lives of his wife, his son, and perhaps others as well. And now Todoroki was fighting back in the only way he knew how. He turned and began to walk away. You're obviously connected to All Might, even if you won't tell me about it, he said. But no matter how fiercely you come at me in the future, I will defeat you using only my right side. I can assure you of that. Then you better hope it's enough. Todoroki stopped, looking back at Izuku. I can't pretend to understand what you've been through. But that doesn't mean I'm going to take it easy on you either. I've had to scrape my way from the bottom of society's shit stick in order to get here. And I'm not about to give up now, said Izuku. I've gotten the better of you twice now, so you better be ready, because I will be coming at you with everything I've got. I can assure you of that. Todoroki said nothing, but turned and continued to walk away. The intermission had ended, and all the students who had not made it into the final 16 were dividing up to participate in side games prepared for them. Yue even brought in cheerleaders from America to perform during the games, and Mainta and Kaminari had tricked the girls from Class 1 to participate with them. Izuku couldn't help but be amused at the fact that for such a smart girl, Yeirazu kept falling for their perverted schemes. When the games ended, the 16 finalists were slated to participate in a round-robin fighting tournament. This is where Izuku expected to really shine. His experience in the underground had prepared him to face off with powerful quirk users in one-on-one -on -one fisticuffs, only this time. He had his utility belt at his disposal, plus he also had his new secret weapon. But that also meant he had to be extra careful. They were still widely untested and potentially dangerous. He had to use them only when absolutely necessary. And his gut told him that it would be against Todoroki. Oh, yeah, said Kirishima excitedly. Finally getting a chance to show what we're made of. I watch these finals every year and now I'm actually in them. Come closer and draw lots to see who you're up against, said Midnight. The 16 finalists have the option of participating in the recreational games or sit out to prepare for your upcoming battles. I'll start with the first place team. Um, excuse me. Everyone turned to see Ajiro raising his hand. Sorry, he said, but I'm withdrawing. Everyone gasped in shock. But this is a rare chance for you to get scouted, said Ida. And sorry, Ajiro said. It wouldn't be right. I barely remember anything from the cavalry battle until the very end of it. I think it was that guy's quirk, he added, more to himself. Izuku turned to see the purple-haired student, Shinso, looking at Ajiro with a scowl. He turned away when he noticed that Izuku was looking at him. Something was off about that guy, and it gave Izuku a funny feeling. I know this is a great opportunity, said Ajiro. I wish I could take advantage of it, but my conscience won't let me. Everyone gave their all in round two, but I was just someone's puppet. No way. I don't want to advance if I don't even know how I got here. It wouldn't be fair. The other members of class 1 tried to convince him to stay. Izuku knew that it was pointless. Ajiro was a warrior, like him, and a warrior's pride was the only true possession that was theirs to keep, and they wouldn't give it away for anything. Another student stepped forward towards midnight. Nyernjiki showed up from class 1B. He said, I would like to withdraw for the exact same reason. This isn't how I wanted to get here. It would go against the values of the festival to advance without earning my spot. Midnight took in a deep sigh. This sort of talk is incredibly naive, my boys, she said. That turns me on. She added suddenly, cracking her whip. Shoda, Ajiro, you're withdrawn. Did she just say it turns her on? Izuku thought. Midnight moved up to members from the runner-up teams to replace Ajiro and Shoda, Tetsu Tetsu, and Ibra Shizaki. The students then drew their lots to determine their matchup, which was put on the jumbotron above them. Todoroki was paired up with Siro, Kaminari with Shizaki, Ida with Hatsum, Ayama against Ashido, Takoyami against Yeyarazu, Tetsu Tetsu against Kirishima, Shinso against another general studies student Izuku wasn't familiar with, and... What Izuku saw made his heart sink to his shoes. His first fight was against Yuroraka. Izuku vs. Yuroraka. It had been 30 minutes since the side game started. Izuku found himself wandering the halls of the contestant preparation center. He and Yuroraka were slated to fight as soon as the side games ended. The cavalry battle had already pitted himself against one of his friends, and now he would have to face off against his best friend. In martial combat, no less. Yuroraka was strong, but she wasn't a fighter. Izuku already knew everything there is to know about her quirk. He had studied the quirks of all his classmates, but with Yuroraka, it was different. There were no secrets between them, and she was the closest friend he had ever had. 
and now that friendship might be in jeopardy. Master Midoriya came a voice behind him. Izuku recognized the voice instantly. He turned to see Alfred standing behind him, foam finger in hand, smiling. Alfred, Izuku said. He had never been happier to see him. I have to say, you've been causing quite a stir among the veteran heroes in attendance today, said Alfred. Such is the burden of the bat, you might say. Alfred cocked his head. Is something amiss, sir? No, not at all. Izuku lied. Izuku, in all my years in his employ, Master Bruce has never been able to keep the truth from me, said Alfred matter-of-factly. What makes you think you will fare any differently? He had him there. I don't know what to do, Izuku said. I have to fight Yuraraka. Ah, I see the quandary, said Alfred knowingly. Miss Yuraraka has performed quite admirably as well in these games. Perhaps she will pose to be more of a challenge than you anticipate. Izuku looked at Alfred, puzzled. Master Bruce has been a patron of UA for years, Master Midoriya, Alfred explained. As such, I have had the distinct pleasure of handling most of the day-to-day -day aspects of that relationship and I have seen a lot of students come through this course. There is a common theme among the students who succeed in the course and those who fail. What's that? Asked Izuku. The students who succeed don't always have lofty goals and admirable intentions, said Alfred. Izuku immediately thought of Endeavor and his conversation with Todoroki. What sets them apart from the others is their willingness to do what is necessary. The path of a hero isn't easy, and sometimes, it will put you at odds with those you would call your friends. And sometimes, failing to do what is necessary will only prolong the pain to come. I don't understand, said Izuku. If Miss Yuraraka wasn't prepared to do what is necessary to succeed, she wouldn't have made it this far, said Alfred. I'm sure she is just as conflicted as you, but knows that if she is to become a hero, then she knows that when a hero is called to battle, a hero answers, even if they know victory is slim. That made sense to Izuku. It was easy to draw the line between hero and villain, but it wasn't always so black and white. Heroes oftentimes found themselves on the other side of that line, as fighting those who were once their friends or allies, if that is where their mission took them. It was a difficult lesson, but a reality heroes had to face every day. Thank you, Alfred, said Izuku. The pleasure is mine, Master Midoriya, said Alfred. Now, I must be back to watch the rest of the games. I believe you know where you need to be. Izuku made his way to the preparation rooms. Yuraraka should be in preparation room too. He wanted to at least talk to her before the match started. Izuku stood outside preparation room too. He must have been standing there for at least two minutes, trying to muster up the courage to knock. He was so lost in thought that he didn't even realize Ada standing beside him and jumped when he finally noticed him. Are you all right, Midoriya? Ada said. I didn't mean to startle you. No, it's all right, said Izuku. I was just distracted. I understand, said Ida. You and Yuraraka are close, aren't you? Yeah, said Izuku. She's the best. I can understand your predicament, said Ida. It wasn't an easy decision to fight against you in the cavalry battle. Ida went silent, looking away. Izuku understood. A part of him probably still felt guilty turning against Izuku in his time of need. Izuku put a hand on Ida's shoulder. It's okay, he said. I understand. Izuku turned back to the door, steeled himself, and knocked. Come in, came Yuraraka's voice from inside. Yuraraka, said Ida as he and Izuku entered the preparation room. She was sitting at a long folding table. It looked like she had been sitting there a while. Deku, she added. Her expression was strange, a mix between happiness, excitement and fear. Izuku didn't quite know what to make of it. Hey, Yuraraka, said Izuku awkwardly. How are you doing? I'm okay, she replied. Izuku could see right through her. Her hands had gone very white, as if she had been wringing them for a while and she was trembling slightly. She must have caught on that Izuku wasn't buying it. Okay, I'm a little nervous. A lot nervous, she added sheepishly. I'm sure there's nothing to worry about, Ida offered. I'm sure Midoriya won't use his full strength against you, right, Midoriya? Er, Izuku said. A small battle waged inside his head. On one hand, Yuraraka was his friend, and he would sooner disembowel himself before hurting her. On the other hand, Izuku was afraid that if he didn't go all out, Yuraraka would be mad at him for patronizing her. Don't you dare, said Yuraraka. Izuku was taken aback. Yuraraka had a look of fierce determination on her face. As she stared Izuku dead in the eyes, he couldn't help but feel an immense power hiding behind her bubbly and laid-back attitude. Don't you dare go easy on me, Deku, she continued. You're wonderful. I see that over and over again, ever since you first came to my rescue back on that street. During the cavalry battle I told you that it was a good idea to team up with friends. But now that I think about it, I might have been trying to rely on you to get by. 
That's why when Ida said that he was trying his best to beat you, I actually felt kind of embarrassed for myself. Izuku never considered this. He was always looking up to Yuraraka for her amazing abilities. He didn't realize that she was looking up to him as well. He was so used to being underestimated by others. He was told he was a useless nobody all his life by Kakan. To be admired by both Ida and Yuraraka was so new to him. Everyone is facing their futures and giving it their best, Yuraraka said. So that means we're all rivals, even you and me, Deku. She raised her shaky hand in a thumbs up. So I'll see you on the battlefield. Izuku smiled. Yuraraka really was amazing. It's time for the first battle of the finals, shouted present Mike. This promises to be an interesting matchup. Yuraraka and Izuku's picture was thrown up on the Jumbotron. As he made his way onto the field, Izuku saw Yuraraka entering the stadium across from him. Her face was pale, but filled with the same determination she had from the room. They made their way to the center of the stadium, where a large fighting ring, surrounded by huge flaming torches. They stood on each side of the ring, facing each other. He's the hotshot upstart from way out of left field. Present Mike continued his commentary. He's a whiz with the tech and has a penchant for explosions, and is the first quirkless student ever to be accepted into UAS hero course, Class 1A's Izuku Midoriya. The crowd roared at his name. Izuku was too embarrassed to wave, simply looking ahead towards Yuraraka. Versus, the one I'm personally rooting for, said present Mike. The infinity girl herself, mistress of gravity, also from class 1A, Achako Yuraraka. Izuku dropped into his fighting stance. Good luck, Yuraraka. Yuraraka readied herself. You too, Deku. Let the first match begin. Yuraraka acted, immediately rushing Izuku. He was ready for her. All she had to do was touch him once. He had to maintain his distance. She ran at him, keeping low to the ground. She was going to swipe upward with her extended left and... No, thought Izuku. No, she's not. It's a feint. She's going to attack with her right. Just as he thought, when she reached him she launched her right hand forward, trying to catch him off guard. He deftly dodged her hand, grabbing it, used her built-up momentum to throw her over his shoulder. She tumbled and rolled back to her feet. Whoa, shouted present Mike. Midoriya has countered Yuraraka's attack. Yuraraka rallied quickly, rushing towards Izuku again. She began thrusting her hands towards Izuku trying to touch him. He continued to dodge and parry her attacks, making sure to avoid her fingers. You've gotten a lot better, Yuraraka, said Izuku between blows. Thanks, Deku, she said, smiling as she continued her attack. I've been practicing. Emphasizing the last word, she threw a high kick directly at Izuku's head, who parried it, instinctively sweeping the foot she was standing on out from under her before she could retain her balance from the kick. She hit the ground hard, but rolled on her back and up to her feet. She's really going all out, said Izuku, impressed. She really had gotten stronger. Yuraraka charged again. Izuku was ready for her. He leaped into the air above her. Yuraraka craned her neck in surprise as she watched Izuku leap gracefully over her. Pivoting in midair, Izuku threw an explosive batarang at her feet, which exploded as soon as it made contact, throwing her forward. She stood back up, brushing herself off. The blast had damaged the ring, debris and rubble strewn across it. Yuraraka charged him again. Izuku threw a smoke pellet down at his feet, disappearing in the smoke as Yuraraka rushed him. Midori is gone in a puff of smoke, said present Mike. His unique training has made him adept at disappearing, but how will it help him in an open arena? Yuraraka ignored the smoke and pressed on, trying to grasp Izuku. Izuku couldn't see in the smoke screen without his mask, but he had grown adept at using his other senses to get his bearings. He could hear Yuraraka's footsteps as they ran into the smoke. He had to be patient and wait for the right moment. He felt a small rush of wind against his side. She had brushed up against him. Now, he reached out and grabbed hold of something, but it was too light to be Yuraraka. The smoke cleared, and he opened his eyes to reveal her gym uniform jacket. He'd been suckered. He dodged her hand as her fingernail barely scratched his cheek. He flipped into a back handspring, getting some distance between them, but not before he left her a parting gift. She balked as she heard a loud, beeping sound somewhere close to her. Very close. Looking down at the source was a small, flashing device attached to her hip. The explosion knocked her off her feet, sending her cascading towards the other side of the ring. She hit the ground hard and rolled a few times before finally coming to a stop, lying in the prone position on the ring. The crowd around them roared in protest, howls and boos ringing out across the stadium. Hey, you big bully, shouted one of the pros, standing in protest. What's the deal, using bombs on her? If you're really so good stop toying with her and push her out of the ring already. Several other heroes yelled in agreement. Whoa, said present Mike. The crowd is actually booing Midoriya. 
I can't say I totally blame them. Using explosives on her like thought he suddenly yelled out in pain. Hey man, what the crap? He said indignantly. Where is the man who started this uproar? Came Aizawa's sharp voice. Are you a pro? Because if you're being serious, you can go home and hang up your cape. I'd suggest looking into another career. The crowd went deathly silent. The hero in question looked completely flummoxed by Aizawa's words. Midoriya's fierceness is an acknowledgement of his opponent's strength. He knows she deserves to be here. He's using whatever he can to keep her at bay to come out on top. Come on, Uraraka, thought Izuku. Get up. Uraraka slowly staggered to her feet, looking at Izuku with a smile. Thanks Deku, she said, for not taking it easy on me, and for keeping your eyes focused on me. Izuku cocked his head, confused. She began to put her hands together, as she did when releasing something she. It suddenly dawned on him. Looking sharply upward, he finally saw what she was talking about. Floating at least 10 meters above them were several of Izuku's bombs and explosive batterings. Izuku couldn't help but laugh despite this. He was so impressed. She continuously rushed him so he would have no choice but to focus on avoiding and countering her. In doing so, she was able to swipe his tools and explosives right out from under him. She had been studying him all this time so she would know exactly what pockets to pick. What's more, Izuku didn't think he needed the countermeasures that protected unauthorized access to his belt for this event, so he deactivated them before the match. He had played right into her hands. He was never going to hear the end of it from Bruce. Release, shouted Uraraka. The bombs and batterings all came crashing down quickly. Uraraka charged Izuku again. The plan was brilliant. If he let the bombs drop, they would detonate on impact and send them both out of the ring. If he tried to stop them, that left him open for Uraraka to use her quirk. She really had gotten so much stronger. But Izuku still had his ace in the hole. He pressed a button on one of his gauntlets. It sprang to life, making a humming sound and glowing a dull blue color at the back of the hands and the forearm. He positioned himself, stretching his palm towards the falling arsenal, bracing it with his other hand. It was time for that field test. The explosion erupted from his outstretched palm was deafening. It cascaded up into the air at least 30 feet, colliding with the other falling weapons, causing them to erupt in an explosion that rocked the stadium, blasting the contestants and some of the audience back, shattering windows and displays. Uraraka was thrown backward in the blast as well, once again landing hard against the floor of the ring. Smoke and debris billowed and fell across the stadium, and the crowd had gone deadly silent. Uraraka strained to get up, but her body screamed in protest. She was pushed past her limit. The last explosion had nearly knocked her unconscious. As the smoke began to dissipate, she saw Izuku walking towards her crumpled form, cradling his hand. Deku, said Uraraka weakly. That hurt like a mother, said Izuku. Are you okay? I can still fight, Uraraka said, wincing as she tried to lift herself. But Izuku held her down. I want you to listen to something, Uraraka, said Izuku. She paused, straining her ears to listen. She could hear a sound, like a cascading waterfall. No, it was clapping. Applause. That applause is for you, Izuku continued. You did so well, and so proud of you. Tears began to form around Uraraka's eyes. I knew I wouldn't have been able to beat you, she said. You almost did, said Izuku. Uraraka looked up at him in surprise. You pulled one over on me. I had to use my trump card early just to stop it. Honestly, you gave me a run for my money. Really? Really? Uraraka is incapacitated, shouted Midnight. Midoriya wins the first, ha. Huh? Midnight stopped short. Izuku had picked up Uraraka up off the ground to a standing position, supporting her weight. Together, they raised their hands to wave the cheering crowd before them. Wow, said present Mike. The crowd is really showing their love for these two contestants. Uraraka put up a great fight, and Midoriya being such a great sport, this is truly one for the record books, people. And with that, the first round of the finals came to an end. Izuku and Uraraka's performance in the first event completely rocked the Caspa, the stadium buzzing with excitement as contestants and observers alike discussing the enthralling and controversial match. Uraraka powerful quirk, tenacity and strategy of swiping Izuku's tools certainly earned her major points with the pros. Izuku was receiving mixed reviews. That Midoriya kid is something else, said one attendee. To do all that he's been doing without a quirk is really impressive. Yeah, but he's still gonna have a hard time being a hero without a quirk, said another observer. I mean, look at Endeavor's son. Not much competition there. I don't know, he seems pretty good to me. Izuku didn't really care about what people thought of him. Right now, his only concern was for Uraraka. After leaving the arena, he accompanied her to see Recovery Girl. 
The explosions had done a number on her, but thankfully it was nothing serious. Izuku still immensely guilty. I'm sorry, you're Araka, he said for the millionth time as recovery girl healed her. Don't be, Deku, she said, surprisingly cheerfully. I told you not to hold back, didn't I? Still, said Izuku sheepishly. She'll be fine, young man, said recovery girl. Although that bomb you put on her hip caused some severe burns, they're healing up nicely. Izuku's stomach twisted. He was so proud of Uraraka and how well she fought in the match, but he still felt terrible at the fact that their match had to be the first. That meant she wasn't able to showcase her abilities anymore to potential recruiters. Still, he knew it would have looked bad if he had just let her win. She wanted to show everyone what she could do on her own, without help. But what really bothered him was that he knew that she had a lot riding on becoming a hero, and the field was oversaturated already, making it that much more difficult for heroes in training to make it in this industry. They only had three chances in their lifetime to make a good impression, and he was afraid that he may have taken that chance away. Such was the price of competition, he supposed. Don't worry, Deku, said Uraraka as if reading his mind. It was a good match. It showed me that I have a lot to learn about fighting. It'll prepare me for the next time. Speaking of which, Uraraka added, Your match is going to be starting soon, right? You better hurry and get ready. I'll be right there. Are you sure? Asked Izuku. Don't worry, said Uraraka again. I'll see you soon, and I'll be cheering you on. Izuku hesitantly left, heading off towards the preparation rooms. Recovery girl went to attend to her other duties, leaving Uraraka alone. She took her phone from her gym bag, but stopped just short of opening it, simply staring at it as it rested in her hand. Tears began to well at her eyes, and she could no longer hold them back. She had failed. She had so much riding on this, and she ultimately fell short. She knew she would have been paired against Deku eventually, but she had hoped it would have been a few rounds in, and not be eliminated in the first round. She wanted to call her parents, but she didn't know if she could. Young miss, are you alright? Uraraka looked up to see a tall, slender man in a black pinstripe suit and bow tie standing in the doorway of the medical wing. He was an elderly man, balding with a grey moustache under his nose, with bright and very kind-looking eyes staring at her. Oh, yes, I'm fine, said Uraraka, attempting to stand. Her knee buckled under her. Now that the adrenaline of the fight had worn off, she was aware of how sore she was, despite recovery girl's treatment. The man stretched his hand forward, helping to steady her. Uraraka looked down to see that she had inadvertently opened the stitching on her knee, which began to bleed. Recovery girl had opted for stitches and bandages and not her quirk considering that she had used a lot of her stamina for the match. It wouldn't have made a difference anyway. Permit me, miss, said the man, placing his hand upon her knee. Startled at first by this rather forward gesture, Uraraka felt a warm, tingling sensation as the man's hand began to glow. After a moment or two, he drew back and her knee was completely healed. I beg your pardon, said the man, bowing slightly as Uraraka stared in amazement. Forgive my manners. My name is Alfred Pennyworth. How does it feel? Much better, said Uraraka. My name is Achako Uraraka. Are you a doctor here too? Not at all, my dear, said Alfred. Simply an old friend of Miss Shuzenji. Recovery girl. He added at Uraraka's confused expression. I didn't realize that there were other healing quirks out there, said Uraraka. It is a rare gift indeed, said Alfred matter-of-factly. And no two of them are quite alike either. He pulled up a stool and sat down across from Uraraka. So what seems to be troubling you, Miss Uraraka? Oh, it's nothing, really, said Uraraka, turning away. I should think that you should be ecstatic, considering how well you did in the festival, Alfred said. It wasn't that close, said Uraraka. I rushed it. I didn't have a backup plan after that big move, and it cost me. I failed. Alfred considered her for a moment. Is that really such a bad thing? Uraraka nodded sadly. I was supposed to do better, go further in the festival so I would have more chances to show what I'm made of. But I couldn't beat Deku, not even at my best. If I'm not mistaken, said Alfred. Izuku Midoriya is rumored to have been trained by the Batman, is he not? That's right, said Uraraka. Well then, said Alfred. I would say that you were at quite a disadvantage from the start, weren't you? I guess so, said Uraraka. He's so amazing, and I'm just… not. Tears began to flow freely as Uraraka placed her face in her hands. Why do you want to be a hero, young miss? Asked Alfred, passing her a silk handkerchief. Uraraka sniffed and wiped her tears. I want to be able to help my parents financially, she said. A noble goal, said Alfred, but potentially dangerous. What do you mean? Said Uraraka. It's none of my business, said Alfred. But I'm sure that you are worth more than money to your parents. And the path of a hero is a hard, dangerous, and sometimes lonely road. Isn't there something else less dangerous that could help you meet your goal? 
Well, yeah, but, Uraraka trailed off. She had considered this initially as well. But it was clear that this day and age the quickest way to celebrity and wealth was through being a hero, even if it was the most dangerous. Let me rephrase, said Alfred. If your parents were to become fiscally secure, what would be your reason to become a hero? Uraraka was silent. She didn't have an immediate answer for this. Yes, her parents were the main reason for her becoming a hero, but she had also considered many other avenues, even working for her father and using her quirk instead of heavy equipment. But her father had always encouraged her to pursue her own dreams, no matter what they were. She thought of Deku, and of how noble and strong his dreams of being a hero are. But the truth is that her only dream has been to alleviate her parents' suffering, even at the expense of her own suffering. It's quite all right not to know right now, said Alfred kindly. But if you would permit this old man to say so, I think you already know the answer. What do you mean? Asked Uraraka. Why, my dear, what is heroism but service to one's fellow men? Alfred said. With that, he bowed and exited the room, leaving Uraraka alone with her thoughts. After a few minutes, she made her way to the preparation room to clean herself and join Deku, and the others to watch the matches. As her current gym uniform was damaged in the battle, she began changing into a new uniform provided for her when her phone rang, startling her. It was her father. Hey dad, said Uraraka, trying not to sound flustered at his surprise call. Achako, her father's voice exclaimed from the other line. Honey, I'm so proud of you. You almost won. Her father's cheerful voice brought Uraraka to her knees, allowing her tears to flow freely. That was something she admired about him. No matter how tough things were, how hard he had to work, and how miserable their situation, he always had a smile on his face. She was old enough that she could see through it, and saw just how beaten down and tired he really was, but he refused to let it show through to her. Achako, her father said concernedly, What's the matter? Oh dad, said Uraraka through her tears. I failed. Honey, don't say that, her father replied kindly. You did so well. Just because you lost the match doesn't mean you can't be a pro hero. I don't have the best understanding of how all this works, but there's always next year, right? This isn't the end. I know, she sobbed. I just wish I could have done better. Achako, what are you in such a hurry for? Her father said, chuckling. Because I want to help you guys out as soon as I can. Achako, there's no need to rush yourself, said her father comfortingly. I don't want that to be the reason you become a hero. What do you mean? Asked Uraraka, wiping her tears. You have always put others first in your life, said her father. Whenever there was someone who needed help, whenever someone was in trouble, you always felt it was your duty to help them. The very fact that you feel that way shows me that you'll make a kind, caring hero one day. The simple fact is, I believe that being a hero to others is what you were born to do. Do you understand? Alfred words before he left flashed through Uraraka's mind like a bolt of lightning. I think you already know the answer. What is heroism but service to one's fellow men? Yeah, she said finally. I think I do. Don't worry about your mother and I, said her father. Things are looking up. How's that? Said Uraraka. I got a call the other day, he replied. It happened so fast I hadn't had time to tell you about it. But an American businessman called me and said that he was expanding his company overseas, starting here in Japan. He said he reviewed my past projects and is impressed with the quality of my work. He's provided me with a huge advance and I've been able to hire more people, purchase new equipment, and we've already started working on projects. You, you're serious, said Uraraka, hardly able to believe her ears. I am, honey, said her father happily. Your father is now the exclusive consulting contractor for Wayne Tech Japan, Achako, one of the biggest companies in the United States. You don't have to rush now, Achako. Now you can focus on becoming the best hero this world has ever seen. I know you'll make us proud. Uraraka sank to her knees, her heart filled to the brim with happiness. She knew that this was just the beginning, and that there would be more trials to await her in the future. But right now, she didn't care. Her family was going to be okay, even without her help, but that didn't matter to her. She now knew who she truly was. I am Achako Uraraka. I am going to save others. I am a hero. Izuku vs Shinso Izuku made his way back to the stadium. He estimated that the first round of matches must be halfway done by now, so he would soon have to prepare for his next battle. He had yet to learn who had advanced to the next round, and had spent a lot of time with Uraraka, so he hadn't had the chance to analyze the other opponent's quirks, leaving him at a disadvantage. But if he hurried, he could make it back in time to watch the tail end of the first round of matches. He stopped abruptly at the end of the hall connecting to the stadium entrance. Leaning against the wall, as if waiting for him, was the general education student Shinso. His face remained passive as his eyes met Izuku's, but his gaze sent an odd chill down Izuku's spine. 
So you're back, he said simply. I finished my first match as well. Looks like we're going to be paired against each other in the next one. Izuku Midoriya, that's you right. Izuku was about to answer when he felt something cover his mouth. Alarmed, he looked back to see Ajiro standing behind him, using the tip of his tail to silence him. Not so fast, he said, glaring at Shinso, who simply smirked smugly and walked away. Midoriya, said Ajiro, releasing him. I've been looking for you everywhere. Ajiro, said Izuku. What was that about? You didn't watch his match, did you? Ajiro asked, concerned. No, I was with Yuraraka, Izuku replied. What's going on? Come with me, said Ajiro. We have to talk about that guy's quirk. Brainwashing. Yes, said Ajiro. His first match was against another general studies student, who simply walked out of the ring at the start of the match. This confirmed my suspicions about his quirk I had from the second event. Izuku clasped his hands together and fought, his stomach churning. Izuku had read reports about villains and criminals with this quirk. It was extremely rare and extremely dangerous. Izuku was reminded of his time in the warehouse with Bruce, poring over case files of criminals and supervillains he had faced, some of them with mind-altering abilities of their own. They varied in strength and effectivity, some using pheromones to influence the opposite gender, as was the case with Pamela Eiley, the beautiful and deadly poison ivy, some used technology to control their victims, like Jervis Tetch, the Mad Hatter. No matter their methods, Bruce made sure Izuku knew in no uncertain terms never to underestimate them. Mind control. The words sounded even more frightening out loud. Can I even defend against something like that? One can't simply control the mind like a pawn on a chessboard, said Bruce. But the constitution can be manipulated, given the right circumstances. Just as there are many ways that this can be accomplished, there are ways to beat it. How? Don't get brainwashed in the first place, Bruce replied. Izuku knew better than to think he was being facetious. A preemptive strike usually yields the best results. If they do manage to get a hold of you, you need to be prepared. Though the effects vary in range, they all have one thing in common, attacking the frontal lobe, the center of cognitive thought and choice. In doing so, the mind becomes foggy and unclear, allowing your lizard brain, responsible for more primal instincts like fight or flight, to take over. This part of the brain is much more susceptible to stimulus, positive or negative, allowing for the subject to be dominated. The best way to fight against these effects is to focus, Bruce continued. We have to train your mind to combat these effects long enough for you to find the catalyst. What's the catalyst? Asked Izuku. Their source of control, said Bruce. Every brainwasher has one. Certain environmental conditions have to be met in order to maintain the effects of the brainwashing. Sometimes, extreme external stimuli can jolt the victim from their hold. Like what? Like a crack to the head, said Bruce simply. Others require more intensive deprogramming. Regardless, even the strongest of people have let their minds be taken because they lacked one thing, focus. It is the key to strengthening your will. What do I do? Asked Izuku. Learn to bring your focus away from the cloud, away from stimuli, internal and external, and center it on the one thing that no one can take from you. Who you are, said Bruce. He then threw Izuku into several simulations designed to overwhelm his senses through intense stimuli, light, darkness, sound, heat, cold, even subjecting him to mild shocks and cracking him over the back and arms with a bamboo staff. Izuku was to stay perfectly still during these sessions, repeating to himself over and over again, I am Izuku Midoriya. I am Izuku Midoriya. I am Izuku Midoriya. Midoriya. Izuku was brought back to reality. Sorry, Ajiro, said Izuku. Please continue. He didn't get into my head until he asked me a question in the second round, said Ajiro. I think that's the secret to his power. But even if he gets you, there's still a chance you can beat it. During the second round, I don't remember anything at all except the very end of the battle. I think we were running away after Shizo took Tetsu Tetsu's headband. I bumped into another person. It was like I woke up, and I was me again. So that bump broke his hold. Maybe, said Ajiro. It's just a guess. Izuku leaned back in his chair. This could be the catalyst Bruce mentioned. Like slapping a hysterical person, enough external trauma could potentially bring someone back to their senses, but it was still too much of a gamble to rely on. Plus, on a one-on-one -on -one battle he couldn't rely on a third party to help him out of it. Anyway, man, said Ajiro, standing up. I hope that helps, because that's all I know. It helps immensely, said Izuku. Thanks Ajiro. You're a good guy. Ajiro sighed. To be honest, I really was hoping I would have gotten the chance to face you in the tournament. Midoriya, he said, extending his hand. Ever since I saw you during the battle training, I've been hoping for a match between us. Izuku shook his hand. Don't worry, he said, smiling. 
You'll get your chance. I'll be looking forward to it too. I know it sounds selfish, but beat this guy for both of us, said Ajiro. I'll do my best. And now for our second round. The booming voice of present Mike was met by a roar of applause. You all know the rules. Immobilize your opponent or force them out of the ring. Izuku tightened his utility belt and stood before his opponent. Shisen's expressionless face differed only by the intense glare behind his eyes. Izuku felt a chill despite himself upon meeting his gaze. He had to end this match quick. If Shinso's quirk was really as powerful as he feared, he couldn't allow him to use it. Not only that, Izuku hadn't had the chance to see Shinso in action, and had no knowledge about his hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. So you can just give up, huh? said Shinso. Izuku said nothing, instead dropping down into a fighting stance. Shinso chuckled. I thought not, he said. In a way, this is a test to show how strong your spirit is. If you know what you want your future to hold, you can't worry about what other people think. Ready, shouted present Mike. That monkey was going on about pride earlier, Shinso continued. But I just think he's an idiot for throwing away his chance like that. Izuku's felt his blood boil, but said nothing. Shinso was trying to goad him. He wasn't going to let it work. Shinso looked slightly annoyed at Izuku's lack of response. Begin. Let's get this over with then, said Shinso. Then you can get back to beating up little girls. Izuku snapped. You watch your goddamn mouth, you arrogant Sonova Izuku froze. Everything around him felt fuzzy, and all conscious thoughts seemed to drift away. He could only vaguely see Shinso's smug smirk through the fog surrounding his eyes. That's it. I win. I told him not to say anything. Ajiro said, standing exasperatedly. What's happening? Said Yuraraka, alarmed. It's his quirk. Said Ida. Midori has been brainwashed. Hello. Said present Mike. This match should have started off with a bang. But now it looks like Shinso's got a hold of another one. Midoriya is completely frozen. That last fight of Shinso's completely floored the audience. Who would have expected such a turn of events? That's the festival for ya. This is a perfect example of why the entrance exam isn't logical. Came Aizawa's drawling voice. I compiled some information about our finalists. Shinso failed the practical exam to get into the hero course. So he also applied for general studies because he probably figured that would happen. His quirk is incredibly strong, but that entrance test consisted of fighting foe villains. Robots, it gave a huge advantage to those who had above average physical abilities they could show off. Despite his abilities, Shinso never stood a chance at passing. So here we are, said Shinso. You're lucky you've been so blessed, Izuku Midoriya. Despite not having powers, you still managed to wow the judges enough to make it into the hero course with your little sideshow gimmicks. Now turn around and walk out of the ring, like a good little hero. Izuku barely felt his limbs move beneath him as they walked towards the edge of the ring. He couldn't think straight, the fog in his mind was too thick. It felt as if there was an instinctual part of his mind that was compelling him to obey Shinso, almost like a survival instinct. The edge of the ring drew closer and closer, and Izuku's concentration grew worse. It was his own fault. He was baited and he fell for it, hook, line and sinker. Now he was about to lose. Even with a quirk like this, Shinso's voice was clear as day through the fog. I have my own dreams for becoming a true hero. So lose for me. No, not like this. He had to focus. He had to remember what Bruce had taught him. He had to remember who he was. My name. His head was so cloudy. My name is. Izuku. He was almost near the edge. It was almost over. Deku. The word came to his mind like lightning. He had heard it before, back in the recesses of his mind. A voice called to him, a voice that sounded familiar. Deku. Kaken. Deku. My name is Deku. His mind began to clear. It was working. My name is Deku. My name is Deku. His pace slowed to a stop. My name is Deku. Then I am a hero. Izuku roared fiercely as he slammed his gauntleted fist into the ground below, igniting an explosion that left a large crack in the ring. Izuku gasped as he regained his composure. As the smoke and dust from the explosion, Izuku saw he had stopped just inches from the edge of the ring. What's this? shouted present Mike in surprise. Midoriya stopped just in time. The crowd erupted in applause. Izuku looked back towards Shinso, shock and disbelief etched on his usually passive face. No, impossible. He said angrily. You're not supposed to be able to fight back. What did you do? Izuku knew better this time. Keeping his mouth shut, he ran towards the shell-shocked Shinso. Come on, say something. He said. I didn't know anyone was strong enough to break my hold. Thanks to my quirk I've always been at a big disadvantage. Of all people, someone who's quirkless like you would know what that's like. But even you were blessed enough to have someone like Batman at your side. Izuku said nothing. He was right. Izuku understood what it was like to be disadvantaged. 
He had lived with it his entire life, always overshadowed by others with even the simplest of quirks. But he was right about something else as well. He had been blessed. Bruce had seen something in him that no one else had, and found a way to bring it to the surface. You're lucky enough to have your training, to have a pro hero at your side, Shinso continued. It will be so easy for you to reach your goal. Say something, you lucky brat. He threw a punch at Izuku, but he deftly dodged it. Using his own momentum against him, Izuku grabbed Shinso by his outstretched arm and threw him in the direction of the ring's edge. The crowd grew hushed as Shinso hit the floor of the ring hard, and his world grew dark. Whenever anyone asked about Hitoshi Shinso's quirk, they always treated him differently afterwards. Some people were excited or jealous about his power, thinking about all the people they could control, or things they could do with a power like his. Others were terrified of him, afraid to be in his presence lest they be controlled by him. He couldn't blame them. He assumed that if he came across someone with this power he would think they would use it for evil, too. Sounds criminal or perfect power for a villain to have they would say to him. He was used to people looking at him like the bad guy. But I'm not. Shinso is out of bounds, shouted Midnight. Izuku Midoriya advances to the next round. Izuku and Shinso stood across from each other as the crowd roared in applause. Shinso looked sullen and angry. Izuku couldn't blame him. He had so much riding on his performance in the festival. He still had a long road ahead of him. Shinso, Izuku said, Why do you want to be a hero? Shinso shrugged, walking away. You can't help what your heart longs for. Izuku understood. He felt the same way his entire life. Every time someone told him he could never be a hero, or that he was too weak, or that his dreams were unrealistic, they weighed heavily on him. He could see that same weight on Shinso's shoulders. Izuku was just like him. Then you better keep trying, said Izuku. Shinso looked at him, confused. I almost gave up on my dream once. I'm only here because of the people that have believed in me. Izuku continued, pointing towards the crowd. And now you have others that believe in you. Shinso looked towards the crowd where Izuku was pointing. His class 1 degrees Celsius classmates were all cheering for him. Not only that, but several pros were talking among themselves about him. With a quirk like that, catching criminals would be easy. Wish I had it. I can't believe they put him in 1 degrees Celsius. Those idiots. Well, there are a lot of applicants this year. Still, he would have dominated if he had more combat experience. Shinso could hardly believe his ears. That's all for you, Shinso, Izuku said. People who believe in you. And now, I'm one of them, so you better not give up. Shinso didn't turn to look at Izuku. Don't worry, Midoriya, said Shinso. I'm going to get onto the hero track, get certified, and become a better pro than any of you. Izuku nodded. Then you better learn to throw a better punch, he said, chuckling. Izuku felt the flash of Shinso's quirk take hold once more. Prepared, Izuku was able to shake it off this time. Nice try, Shinso chuckled, finally looking back. Better keep your guard up, Midoriya, he said. You better not lose and make me look bad. Izuku couldn't help but smile as he made his way back to the preparation room. He had a feeling he'd be seeing Shinso again in no time at all. Contestants and Casualties During the first round, Todoroki made his way towards the arena. He and his classmate, Siro, were the last fight of the first round. He was still pondering Midoriya's victory over Yuroraka. He was foolish to let her get the drop on him like she did. It could have very well cost him the match. Still, Todoroki knew that he would prevail. Even if he was fighting his friend, there was no way Midoriya would lose. But even he had to admit he was surprised by Midoriya's new equipment. He knew that he favored explosives, but these new gauntlets could give him a significant edge against the other competitors. They seemed to be more versatile, projecting the explosions outwardly from his hands, allowing for better control of the blasts. Not only that, he could use them at close range, allowing him to get in closer to his enemy to deal devastating damage. But Todoroki wasn't worried. Ever since the battle training, Todoroki had underestimated him. Not anymore. He would beat him with his mother's quirk, quickly and efficiently. He would show everyone, especially him that he did not need his quirk to. Todoroki froze. What do you want? He spat angrily. At the end of the hallway, leaning against the wall, stood a powerful, towering figure. Easily over six feet tall, his powerful, muscular frame was made even more intimidating by the billowing red flames that pulsated across his body. His face and shoulders in particular roared with orange flame, but even they were too weak to hide the scowl he wore. You're acting disgracefully, Shoto, said Endeavor. If you had simply used the power in your left side, you would have had an overwhelming victory in both of the first rounds. Instead, your stubborn impudence has allowed you to be bested by that quirkless boy twice now. That quirkless boy was trained by Batman, said Todoroki. Endeavor snorted. Hardly an excuse, he said. 
It's time to stop this childish rebellion of yours. You have a duty to surpass that imbecile all might. Continuing to limit yourself will only result in more defeats. Todoroki continued walking past his father without looking at him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Said Endeavor. You're different from your siblings. You are my greatest masterpiece. Todoroki clenched his teeth. He hated that name. Constantly bragging about his greatest creation or wondrous masterpiece, reduced to nothing but a trophy and a tool in his father's eyes. It disgusted and angered him. Is that all you have to say to me, you bastard? Todoroki snarled. I'll win this match and advance using only mom's quirk. I won't give you the pleasure of seeing me use yours. Even if that works for you in this tournament, you'll soon find the limits of that power, said Endeavor. Enough standing around, shouted present Mike. Let's welcome our next competitors, the last of the first round. The four corners of the arena erupted in roaring flames as the crowd cheered. He's got skills, but at the expense of some really creepy looking elbows. From the hero course, it's Hanta Siro. That was uncalled for, said Siro, stretching his arms. Versus an early frontrunner in the competition who's way too strong for his own good, continued present Mike. Someone who had rightfully got into the hero course based on recommendations. It's Shoto Todoroki. Iroraka and Ida sat on the edge of their seats. She wished that Deku was here to see this, but he and Ajiro were preparing for his next match. Iroraka couldn't help but notice something seemed to be off with Todoroki. Ida, she said, nudging her friend. Does Todoroki look different somehow? What do you mean? Asked Ida. I mean, he just looks like something's wrong, said Iroraka. Now that you mention it, said Ida, looking closer. Todoroki's head was bowed, the shadow from his long hair hiding his eyes. He had a strange aura about him, and looking at him made Ida feel uneasy. I wonder what could be wrong. Begin, shouted present Mike. Siro sighed as he continued to stretch. I don't really think I can win this fight, he said. But still, in a flash of lightning speed, Siro whipped a long strip of tape from his elbow, wrapping it around Todoroki. With impressive strength relative to his size, he hurled his captive towards the edge of the ring. I don't feel like losing, either. Whoa, said present Mike. A surprising move from the underdog. Way to start of strong, Siro. For a brief moment, it looked as if it was about to be over before it began. But the force of the throw had blown Todoroki's hair from his face, and what Yuraraka saw made her recoil. From the depths of Todoroki's eyes was a boiling hatred that would make the strongest of men falter. Todoroki had always been calm, collected, even in the face of danger. But the person facing Siro in the ring did not appear to be that same Todoroki. Apologies, Siro heard him say. He slammed his foot to the ground, stopping him from flying outside the ring. Siro only had an instant to gasp as the ice creeping across the ground quickly encased him. The entire stadium shook around them, the audience crying out in unison in alarm and fear. Izuku and Ajiro had finished their meeting, and were making their way back to the stadium when the ground shook violently beneath them. Is that an earthquake? shouted Ajiro, steadying himself against the wall. The shaking stopped, and they ran at full speed towards the stadium bleachers. The audience was deathly quiet as the wall of ice stopped inches from their faces. The heroes patrolling the ground froze in collective shock, and even present Mike was at a loss for words. A giant mountain of jagged ice stretched upward from the arena below, extending at least several miles out of the open roof of the stadium. Todoroki exhaled softly, a small cloud of vapor escaping his mouth. His entire left side was covered in frost and ice, and he easily broke the now frozen cellophane that was wrapped around him. Um, said Siro weakly, encapsulated from the neck down at the base of the ice mountain. Don't you think you went a little overboard? Tell the truth, Siro, said Midnight, half frozen and shivering. Can you move at all? Are you kidding? Said Siro. Obviously not. My body is freezing. Siro has been immobilized, shouted Midnight. Siro advances to the second round. There were a bunch of audience members yelling nice try, in an effort to comfort the frozen Siro. Todoroki walked towards his opponent, almost sheepishly. Sorry, he said. That was a bit much. He placed his left hand on Siro's chest. Immediately, the ice around him began to melt. I was angry, is all. Izuku watched curiously as he watched Todoroki melt Siro from his ice prison. For some reason, Todoroki looked very sad to him. Present time. Izuku's fight with Shinso marked the beginning of the second round of fighting. The victors advancing included Todoroki and Izuku himself, but also Ashido, who had managed to knock Aoyama off his feet and out of the match with an impressive uppercut, Kirishima, who in an incredible display of redundancy actually tied his rival Testutetsu, allowing them a tiebreaker match in the form of an arm wrestling competition, which Kirishima had just managed to win. Ida was also advancing, having won his match against Meihatsu, 
who in reality had him wear one of her devices and make him run around the arena while she showed off her devices to recruiters. She later stepped out of the ring herself after adequately making a show of herself. Kaminari had defeat handed to him easily by the pious Shizaki. Lastly, Takoyami had earned an impressive victory against Class 1A's vice president, Yeyorazu. He managed to impede her creation quirk through quick attacks, not allowing her to focus long enough to form a strategy. Izuku felt a little bad for her, as she took the quick loss pretty hard. The battles began again with Kirishima and Ashido. Kirishima's hardening quirk came in handy against Ashido's acid, but in the end, allowing him to get close enough to her to push her out of the ring. Though Shizaki was strong against Kaminari, she soon found herself outmatched by Dark Shadow, unable to withstand its speed and ferocity. With Izuku, Takoyami and Kirishima advancing to the semi-finals, that left only Todoroki and Ida. Izuku was particularly interested in this match. Though Todoroki was quick, Ida was much faster than, potentially allowing him the maneuverability to avoid his ice traps. Conversely, as displayed in his previous match, Todoroki was able to cover large areas with ice and great speed with little effort. The crowd roared as the two powerhouses readied themselves for battle. Begin, shouted present Mike. Ida wasted no time. Obviously using his speed to his advantage, he decided the direct approach was too dangerous and opted to try and flank his opponent instead, running in a wide circle around him. Todoroki launched himself backwards away from Ida, using his quirk to leave a trail of ice in his wake. Ida managed to avoid it, but only just. If he had continued on his course, he would have slipped out of the ring. Todoroki would have to do better than that. When Todoroki jumped away, Izuku noticed something odd with his movement. Though it was still quick, he noticed that his movement appeared slightly sluggish and heavy when using his right side. When he had used the ice on Siro, his right side was nearly covered in frost and ice. Perhaps this is a side effect of only using half of his quirk, Izuku thought to himself. He doesn't have the heat to regulate his body temperature, slowing him down. That meant Ada had a huge advantage, and could potentially win if he could exploit this weakness. But Todoroki was no one's fool. He must have anticipated his disadvantage because he stomped his foot hard onto the ground below. Ice formed quickly beneath his foot and spread across the entirety of the ring, stopping in a small circle around Ida. In an instant, he knew that his quirk was useless. If Ida tried to run, he would slip on the ice and fall out of bounds. Now it didn't matter if Todoroki was slower than him, he leveled the playing field. But this didn't mean that he wasn't giving up without a fight. With an eruption of his reciprobers, he launched himself into a spinning kick towards Todoroki who ducked just in the nick of time. But Ida's speed proved to be too much, even for Todoroki, as he launched a second kick that landed heavily upon Todoroki's back. Ida had only seconds left of his reciproburst. Grabbing Todoroki by the back of his shirt, he launched forward towards the edge of the arena, ready to throw him out of bounds. He never made it. His speed reduced instantly, stopping Ida in his tracks. He looked in horror as ice formed around the muffler of his calf. He Todoroki had used his own attack against him, and the ice continued to grow rapidly as Todoroki seized his chance, encasing Ida up to the neck in ice. Ida is incapacitated, said Midnight. Todoroki advances to the semi-finals. Izuku made closed his notebook. It was an impressive fight, and he learned a lot. He was proud of Ida. He fought gallantly, but the odds were stacked against him, even with his speed. Izuku stood and made his way towards the preparation room. He was up next against Kirishima, and he had to get ready. The crowd roared as Izuku and Kirishima had stepped onto the ring. They both had become crowd favorites, and everyone was looking forward to their match. Kirishima looked ready to explode with excitement. This battle would determine who would be the first contestant to advance to the finals. All right, Midoriya, he said, cracking his knuckles. I've been so pumped for this rematch. No shadows to hide in this time. Izuku smiled, tightening his belt. The truth was, he had been looking forward to this too. He still felt a little bad dropping him down several stories during the training battle, and wanted to give a decent battle this time. One on one. Begin. Kirishima wasted no time. He immediately rushed Izuku, hardened fist at the ready. Izuku was ready for this, standing his ground. Kirishima was a brawler, tried and true, and his quirk allowed him to get in close to his enemy without fear of injury. Kirishima is already off at full speed, said present Mike. But Midoriya doesn't look phased at all. This should be an interesting match. Take this, shouted Kirishima, throwing a punch. Izuku dodged effortlessly. Kirishima continued his barrage, undaunted, each blow being parried or dodged by Izuku. Looks like Midoriya is playing it safe this round, said present Mike. Kirishima just isn't landing any blows. You have to admire Midoriya's dexterity. 
you'll have to fight back eventually, Midoriya, said Kirishima. Izuku bounded over his head, avoiding a sweeping kick to his feet. While in midair, he placed an explosive disc on Kirishima's back, blasting him forward. Nice try, said Kirishima, getting back up. Your bombs can't get past my quirk. The battle continued this way for several minutes, Izuku dodging Kirishima's attacks and taking pot shots at him with his explosives. You know, Kirishima, said Izuku, I've always admired your quirk. Really, said Kirishima. Yeah, said Izuku, bounding over his head again. It's really cool. What hero agency wouldn't want an intern with a sturdy quirk like yours? Thanks, Midoriya, said Kirishima cheerfully, throwing a punch and narrowly missing Izuku's head. But the thing about quirks, said Izuku, as mighty as they are, they are still rooted in biology and are subject to the same strengths and weaknesses of our bodies. Which is exactly why you attacked first. You wanted to avoid a drawn-out battle with me. But I've been making sure your quirk stayed activated this whole time with my explosives. And now I think I've waited long enough. Izuku immediately went on the offensive, using his gauntlets to launch immense explosions at Kirishima. The sudden change in tactics caught Kirishima off guard, trying to protect himself from Izuku's onslaught. He cried out as he felt a sharp pain from his side, looking down to see a large crack in his hardening quirk. The attacks continued, and the arena around them filled with smoke. Eventually, the explosions died down and the smoke cleared out, revealing Izuku standing over a charred and smoking Kirishima. Kirishima is incapacitated, shouted Midnight. Midoriya advances to the finals. Izuku knelt down next to his friend. Sorry about that, he said, helping him up. Might have went a little overboard. You okay? Hiroshima grunted as he raised his shaking hand, placing it on Midoriya's shoulder. That was so cool, he said, smiling weakly. Hasu City, miles from the UA Sports Festival. A dark figure stood triumphantly over the bloodied, broken remains of a fallen hero. Ingenium, the turbo hero, as the world knew him. But the figure knew better. To him, the dying scum that lay at his feet deserved but one name. Fake. Fame. Money. That's what all who call themselves heroes are really after. But he knew better. Those bastards couldn't dare call themselves heroes. Except one. The only one who could stand against him. The only one who had the honor of killing him and ending his crusade. All Might. A true hero. Only All Might is worthy. Izuku vs Todoroki. I don't want to be the kind of guy he is. The small child sobbed heavily in his mother's arms, shaken to his core. His father had hurt him. He always hurt him when he didn't perform his training to his satisfaction. It didn't matter to him if his arms broke, his skin tore, or his ligaments burst. The alternative of perfect performance was usually far worse for the six-year-old Shoto. Shoto wasn't allowed to play. He wasn't allowed to go near other children, not even his own siblings. His father said it was for his own good. He said it would make him stronger. He said he didn't have the luxury afforded to the others, and this would allow him to surpass them. He said it was his destiny and duty as his greatest masterpiece to beat All Might and to become number one. You live in a different world than the one I have planned for you. Shoto didn't want to be the number one hero. He didn't want to beat All Might. His father brought him pain and misery. His anger was as hot and fierce as the flames on his face, but his eyes beneath those flames were as cold as an arctic wind. All Might was different. All Might made him feel safe. He made him feel hopeful. But the hope would always die. Overcast by the dark shadow of his father and his ambition, Shoto sobbed harder. I don't want to be someone who bullies you and hurts people, Mama. His mother held him close, lovingly rubbing his back to calm him down. But Shoto, she said, you still want to be a hero, don't you? Just remember, stay true to yourself. It's the final round. The stadium roared as Todoroki took the stage for the final match of the tournament. His previous match with Takoyami had been difficult. His dark shadow quirk was immensely powerful. But the more that he continued to use his eyes, the weaker the creature appeared to be. It wasn't long before Todoroki realized that the creature's weakness was light, and the reflection of the sun against his eyes only exacerbated its weakness. In the end, Takoyami was backed into a corner and had surrendered. Todoroki clenched his fist as he watched Midoriya enter the ring across from him. This was the moment that he had been waiting for. The truth was he didn't hold any animosity towards Midoriya at all. He was often impressed at how resourceful and skilled he was, despite having no quirk. And his performance during hero training, the USJ incident, and the sports festival up to now was nothing short of incredible. As much as it pained him, it was necessary to pick a fight with him. His connection to All Might in truth mattered little to him. He was simply a means to an end. This was his chance to show that old bastard that he didn't need his quirk to be the best. He would reject him, and everything he stood for. Midoriya ignored the roaring crowd around him, tightening his gauntlets and utility belt. Todoroki would have to play this cautiously. 
He had underestimated him twice before, and each time it had cost him. He couldn't take that risk this time. He would keep him at a distance, as far away from his gauntlets and tools as possible. He had to make this count. It was his last shot. These two heroes in training have both been the front runners since the beginning of the festival, shouted present Mike, Midoriya versus Todoroki, who will advance to be this year's grand champion. The prodigious son of the number two hero, Todoroki, or the mysterious upstart that no one saw coming. The protege of the Dark Knight himself, Midoriya. Midoriya finished his preparation, finally making eye contact with Todoroki. What he saw puzzled him greatly. Midoriya was looking at him in a peculiar way, a way that Todoroki couldn't quite place. It wasn't a look of fear, anger, or determination. It was a look of pity. No, not pity. It was more than that. Sadness. It was sadness. Before the final match, Izuku made his way back to the preparation room. Todoroki's battle with Takoyami had just ended, and they had some time to rest and prepare for the finals. Izuku had to be ready. He no longer had the luxury of his opponent's ignorance to use to his advantage. Todoroki would be ready for him, and his tricks wouldn't save him this time. He would have to fight him on his terms. Privately, Izuku was growing concerned about his gauntlets. He had used them more than he had wanted in the past few matches. They were still only prototypes, and he was worried about their integrity. He would have to use more glycerin than he was comfortable with to fend off Todoroki's attacks, and if they were compromised in the blasts, they could do some serious damage, both to himself and Todoroki. He had to be careful. Izuku was so lost in thought that as he walked along the hallway that he didn't even realize he had almost bumped into someone. Looking up from his gauntlets, he jumped back nearly a foot, startled by the figure in front of him. Endeavor, ah, oh, I've been looking for you, said Endeavor, pointing at him. Izuku cursed internally. What is it with this family and their obsession with me? He thought to himself. What can I do for you, sir? He asked aloud. I've been watching your fights against the other students, he said. I have to say, you have impressed me. That doesn't happen easily. You have made such short work of the other contestants, not to mention freeing yourself from the control of that brainwashing student. Your strength of will is astounding. Izuku was taken aback. Was he actually receiving compliments from Endeavor? All of this without a quirk, he continued. It is unfathomable. It is a shame that fate dealt you such a hand. If you had a quirk you could truly become unstoppable. And there it was. If you'll excuse me, Izuku said, not bothering to hide the impatience from his voice. I have to get ready. My son tells me that you were trained by Batman, said Endeavor as Izuku began to walk away. I was not aware that he had taken another student. One would think that he would have let the ground settle before moving on to the next psychic. Izuku froze. What do you mean? Izuku asked. Endeavor cocked his head in confusion. You did not know. He said. He did not tell you about him. Tell me what? Asked Izuku, alarmed. About who? About the last Robin. I am here. As if out of nowhere, a large yellow blur came rushing down the hallway, flipping clear over Endeavor's head and landing next to Izuku. To say hello to Endeavor. Finished All Might. All Might, Endeavor snarled. Izuku was startled by the intensity of Endeavor's. It's been a long time, All Might said. I haven't seen you since we had that press conference ten years ago. I saw you talking with young Midoriya here and figured I would say hi. Did you now? Said Endeavor. Well then if that's all you wanted to do, then we're done. I wasn't through talking with Midoriya. Come on, why the cold shoulder? Laughed All Might. Endeavor scowl deepened. After all, continued All Might. You should be thrilled. After all, your son has made it to the finals, just using half his power. You must be a great teacher. Are you implying something? Snapped Endeavor. No, said All Might. I want to know your secrets. How do we train the next generation of heroes? Endeavor snorted. Do you really think I would tell you anything I've taught the boy? He said. You're all flash and no brains as usual. Let me assure you of one thing, All Might. That kid of mine will beat you, someday. I'll make sure of it. That's why I made him. All Might's smile faded slightly. You did what? He's in a rebellious phase right now, Endeavor continued. But he will take your place. I'll make sure of it. It's my Shoto's duty to surpass you as the number one hero. He turned his gaze back to Izuku. This fight against you will be a good testing ground for how much training he has left. If he can't beat a some vigilante's quirkless whelp, then he has longer to go than I feared. Make sure you hit him hard. Use every toy and gadget you have at your disposal. Don't disgrace him or yourself by holding back. Now wait just a minute All Might began angrily, but Izuku stepped in. That's enough, Izuku said. I'm sick of this bullshit. Both Endeavor and All Might were taken aback by Izuku's sudden candor. He looked Endeavor right in the eye. 
I don't know what kind of sick fantasy you have playing in your mind, but if you ask me for the work you've done all you've managed to do is raise a son that hates your guts. Now you've dragged me into this family squabble based on imagined connection you've made between me and him. He gestured to the stunned All Might next to him. Well I'm gonna lay it out for you, there, isn't. 1. I am not the next All Might, and your son isn't going to be the next Endeavor. Even if he beats me today, even if he beats All Might someday, it will be in spite of you, not because of you. Why, you insolent? Endeavor said furiously. All Might quickly stepped between them. I think you should take a walk, friend, said All Might warningly to Endeavor. Go see your son before the match. Endeavor hesitated, his eyes darting back and forth between All Might and Izuku. Finally, he turned on his heel and walked away. All Might turned back to Izuku. Way to stand up to him, young Midoriya, he said, placing a giant hand on his shoulder. Izuku shook it off, shot a glaring look at All Might, and then walked away. All Might sighed, scratching the back of his head in thought. So Bruce hasn't told him about Jason yet, he said. This could be bad. Let the final match, said present Mike, begin. Todoroki immediately sent an enormous pillar of ice towards Izuku. The ice towered over Izuku at least 15 feet and approached with an intense speed. Todoroki wasn't taking any chances, he wasn't playing it safe. He wanted to see how far Izuku would go to beat him and how much it would take him to beat Izuku. Izuku fired off a blast from his gauntlets, shattering the ice barrage and sending an intense cold wind throughout the audience. The recoil from the blast sent ripples of intense pain through his arms. He had no way of knowing just how strong Todoroki's ice attack was going to be, so using this much power in his gauntlets was necessary. But he didn't know how much his hands could take. Whoa, shouted present Mike. Midori countered his ice attack with a gauntlet blast. Another ice barrage came at Izuku, faster than before. He shot another blast from his gauntlets, shattering the ice again. He felt an intense pain in his fingers that made him wince and recoil. His thumb and index finger were broken. There was no way Todoroki didn't notice. Now he knew the amount of force to use against him. If his ice attacks didn't stop him, then all he had to do was wait Izuku out until he was too injured to continue. He was smart, very smart. Izuku couldn't collect much data from Todoroki's fighting style. He rarely got in close, and his ice attacks were so fast he could barely discern them. He obviously anticipated Izuku's penchant for explosives, as he braced himself by throwing up a wall of ice behind him. This would prevent him from being thrown out of bounds. He'd have to change tactics. Let's continue, said Todoroki, sending a third ice barrage his way. Izuku was prepared this time, running towards the ice. At the last possible moment, he used his gauntlets to launch himself into the air above the ice and towards his opponent. A look of surprise briefly broke across Todoroki's face as he barely dodged Izuku's incoming attack. You're trying to get in close, said Todoroki, but I won't let you. He launched more ice towards Izuku as he landed from his attack. Izuku jumped too late, and his foot was encased in his ice. No, 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 thought Izuku. Ice continued to grow around him as Todoroki tried to entrap him. There was nothing for it. Izuku had to go for broke, putting his gauntlets at full power. He slammed them into the ice below him, sending an immense explosion toward Todoroki, shattering the ice and covering his adversary in smoke and soot. Izuku cried out in pain from the blast. His shoulder was dislocated, his clothes were seared and torn, and the skin on his arm he used from the gauntlet blast was blackened and burned. His muscle fibers were visible beneath the torn flesh from the burns, and blood seeped gushed from an open gash on his forehead mixed with the sweat tears, and smoke in his eyes, making it difficult to see. He looked down at his hands. The gauntlet on his injured arm was destroyed. His other was still intact, but sparking and leaking fluid. With his gauntlets nearly out of commission, he had to be extra careful now. That was much stronger than before, Izuku heard Todoroki say as the smoke cleared. Izuku was shocked. He had anticipated Izuku's counter-attack and had surrounded himself in thick ice pillars, protecting him from being thrown out of bounds. He was different from the last time they fought one-on-one. -on -one. During the hero training, Izuku was able to get the drop on him easily. His quirk had afforded him an advantage that no one else had, and was able to beat people just through sheer overwhelming force alone. But now that he no longer underestimated him, he was calling upon every skill. An ability he could muster not just his quirk, but his judgment, mobility, reasoning. All of his abilities were plain incredible, and combined together made him dangerously powerful. But it was when Todoroki pulled himself out of his ice protection is when Izuku finally noticed. His right side was covered in frost and ice, just like in his previous matches. Without his left side to regulate his body temperature, any more big ice attacks will add to the frost and slow his body down. 
the exact reason why he wanted to avoid a drawn-out match. There was Izuku's window. I'm sorry about this, said Todoroki, looking into the stands. But thanks for drawing it out. Look at him. He gestured towards the fuming endeavor, watching angrily from the stands. He's furious I'm not using his power. He looked back at Izuku. You don't look like you can fight anymore. Why don't we end this? Without even moving, he sent another pillar of ice towards the injured Izuku. Whoa, shouted present Mike. Todoroki continues his overwhelming attack. Could this be his finishing move? Izuku suddenly lifted his dislocated shoulder upwards sharply, shrieking in pain as it popped back into place. He reached into his utility belt and pulled out a canister of explosive gel. I'm not done yet, he shouted. The ice had nearly reached Izuku when an immense explosion, greater than the ones before completely shattered the ice and sent Todoroki flying towards the edge of the ring, stopping himself from falling out just in time. He stared in stunned silence when the smoke cleared, seeing the empty explosive gel canister and Izuku's injured arm outstretched. Only bits and pieces of his broken gauntlet were left on his blackened hand. His fingers were mangled and his arm stuck out at an odd angle. The sight sickened Todoroki. Midoriya had sprayed the explosive gel on his injured hand to punch the ice in an effort to both stop the attack and spare his uninjured arm. You're too hurt to fight, Midwaria, said Todoroki. Why are you going this far? You're trembling, Todoroki. Todoroki was taken aback. Izuku wasn't looking at him, instead hanging his head and concealing his eyes. When he spoke he sounded odd, speaking in a quiet but deeply disturbing growl. Are you feeling cold? Izuku continued. It's easy to forget that quirks are first and foremost physical abilities. You're fast approaching your limit. If you used your left side, this wouldn't be a problem. But you won't. And that pisses me off. Finally his eyes met Todoroki who stepped back in disturbed surprise. Midoriya looked as if he had been pushed over the edge, a look of mania, pain and anger. I've been quirkless my entire life, Izuku continued. I've had to claw my way up with my fingernails to get here. I've trained until my bones broke, studied until my eyes bled, and worked past the point of exhaustion. And then there's you, gifted with an amazing ability far beyond the dreams of even the average pro. I can't understand what you've gone through in your life, but the very fact you would limit yourself out of some piss-poor sense of rebellion against your douchebag of a father while the rest of us desperately give it everything we have just to be here. Izuku walked closer, wrenching his crooked arm and fingers back into place, making Todoroki wince at the sickening cracking and crunching they made as he did. You spit on everything that we, that I have worked for. Look at me, Todoroki. You haven't managed to get a single scratch on me yet. And if you can't beat a quirkless weakling like me then you don't deserve to be a hero. Izuku broke into a full sprint towards his opponent. Stop screwing around and fight me with everything you've got. In the VIP box, Bruce watched the match unfold, his face passive as usual to the untrained eye. But he gripped the arms of his chair so tightly that his knuckles and fingers had lost their color. Izuku was pushing himself too far. He had abandoned his cautious approach before and was now out for blood. My god, said the woman in the wheelchair in amazement. He relocated his shoulder and set his broken bones by himself in the middle of the match. That's frightening, said the long-haired man. But so badass. They need to stop this match before he kills himself, said Alfred, worried. No, said Bruce. All three of them looked at him in surprise. This is something he needs to do for himself. You can't be serious, Master Bruce, said Alfred incredulously. Just look at the state of him. He could have permanent damage. Bruce didn't answer, continuing to watch the fight. Of course he was concerned for Izuku, but he knew the boy would never forgive him if he stopped the fight. But it was more than that. Bruce could see that Izuku wasn't just trying to beat Todoroki anymore. He was trying to draw him out, get him to use his full power. He was trying to get him at his full power. He looked over towards Endeavor, who scowled angrily at the match below. Todoroki had refused to use his fire quirk in the tournament, his father's quirk. There had to be a reason for it, a reason that Izuku seemed to know, and was now exploiting in an attempt to draw out Todoroki's full power. He's not trying to beat him anymore, thought Bruce. He's trying to help him. Bruce couldn't help but feel proud. It was easy to beat your opponent, but helping them fight their demons, helping them get better, was the mark of a true hero. What are you trying to do here, Midoriya? said Todoroki angrily. You want my fire? Did that bastard bribe you or something? Now I'm mad. As Midoriya reached the middle of the arena in his sprint, Todoroki began to run towards him as well, but his movements were slower and sluggish. He had used too much ice. Midoriya didn't break his sprint as Todoroki ran towards him. He was going to face him head on, and Midoriya was too injured too. But as soon as they reached each other, Midoriya found his opening and landed a powerful blow to Todoroki's abdomen, 
causing the remaining gauntlet to explode and send him flying backwards. Izuku cried out, the explosion causing intense pain through his broken index finger and thumb. Todoroki had managed to touch him on his injured arm, and ice spread quickly on it before letting go from Izuku's punch. Todoroki staggered to his feet, coughing from the force of the blow. Why? He thought angrily. Why is he doing this? Aizawa watched the match unfold below him as present Mike rambled on with his commentary. He was deep in thought as he watched Midoriya struggle throughout the fight. Midwaria was pushing himself past his breaking point. He was full of adrenaline, and probably didn't realize how much pain he was in. To go through so much damage and still put up a fight takes an absurd amount of resolve. He looked over towards Wayne in the VIP box. What's driving him? He thought to himself. Why is he so intent? Izuku and Todoroki continued their brawl. Izuku's remaining gauntlet was finally destroyed, and the rest of his fingers were broken from the trauma. He continued to launch himself towards Todoroki, using his remaining explosives to destroy his ice attacks. He was running low, and his fingers made them difficult to grasp and hold. Todoroki continued desperately to ward off Izuku's attacks. Why? He shouted. Why are you putting yourself through this? Izuku lunged at Todoroki, launching into a flying kick that connected squarely on Todoroki's chest, sending him backwards. Izuku hit the ground hard, unable to stop himself. Both of them struggled to get to their feet. I want to. Become what? He isn't, said Izuku, panting heavily. The man who told me I could never be a hero, that my dreams were unrealistic. I want to show everyone who tried to decide what's best for me they were wrong. I want to show everyone that you can be a hero, no matter what your circumstances are. I want to stay true to myself. I want to be a pro. Todoroki's eyes widened. An image of his mother flashed through his mind. Shoto, a hard kick connected across Todoroki's face, sending him careening sideways. And that's why I'll give it my all, continued Izuku. Just like you should be. Stay true to yourself. Become the hero you want to be, not what he wants you to be. Todoroki stumbled to his feet, blood seeping down face from Izuku's blow. Shut up, he said. Frost continued to build across his right side. Shut up, Shoto, you still want to be a hero, don't you? That's why I'm going to win this, shouted Izuku, landing another blow. If you can't accept yourself and who you are, then you'll get left behind. I'll surpass you. Todoroki felt like his mind was going to crack in two. He could hear the voices he had long since forgotten, relived memories he had buried deep inside himself. Get up. If you get beaten that easily you can forget about beating All Might, or even a small-time villain. A gruff, angry voice. Stop pushing him, he's only five years old. A kind, gentle voice. He can take it. Get out of the way. Pain. I can't raise him anymore. I want to run away. The burning pain. Moronic woman. To hurt you at such an important time. Where did Mama go? She tried to hurt my masterpiece, so I sent her to a hospital to keep you safe. It's your fault. To keep you safe. You're the reason she hurt me. My masterpiece. I will reject you. I refuse, said Todoroki. His body ached. He was shivering, barely able to stand for the cold and the pain. I refuse to use my left side. I won't give him the satisfaction. Fuck what he wants, shouted Izuku. It's yours. Your quirk, not his. That's right. Children often do inherit quirks from their parents or develop similar power sets. A different voice. A stronger voice. But the most important thing to remember is that a quirk is what you make of it, regardless of your history. He knew that voice. You decide how you'll use it. Only you can decide to become a hero, no one else. All Might. Just remember, stay true to yourself. The gentle voice again. You are not a prisoner of your lineage. It's okay to use your power. Mom, become who you want to be. The audience gasped in horror and amazement as the spot where Todoroki stood in the ring ring erupted in a blaze of orange and red. A wave of heat and light pulsated throughout the stadium. Whoa, shouted present Mike over the speakers. Todoroki is using his fire. Fire pulsated from Todoroki's left side, while ice continued to grow from his right, with steam and smoke billowing around him like an angry storm. You fool, Todoroki said. Even though you said you wanted to win this, you decided to help me. Now who's screwing around? He dropped down into a fighting stance. I want to do it, Todoroki continued. I'm going to be a hero. For the first time since Izuku had met him, Todoroki smiled. A smile of more than euphoria or happiness, but of sheer, intense passion. He had found his passion. Izuku couldn't help but smile back, dropping down into a fighting stance himself. It's about damn time, he said. Yes s-h-o-t-o. -O. A deep booming voice broke the cheers of the audience. Endeavor was cheering. The flames across his shoulders and chest blazing as he walked down the stairs of the audience towards the ring. Have you accepted your purpose? He said. That's it. Very good. This is the dawn of a new era for us. With my blood in your veins you will surpass me. 
You will live up to the reason I created you. The audience around him were staring in blatant confusion at Endeavor's sudden outburst, which contrasted completely with the silent, brooding character they had come to know as the number two hero. Endeavor suddenly shouts words of encouragement, said present Mike, bemused. What a doting father. But the world around them fell on deaf ears for Todoroki and Izuku. Why are you smiling? asked Todoroki. With those injuries, the situation is hopeless. You must be crazy. All the best heroes are, said Izuku, laughing. Just don't blame me for what happens next, said Todoroki. The two ran at full speed at each other. Todoroki's ice and flames grew, and Izuku reached into his belt and pulled out every last explosive he had. Cementos began to throw up barriers between them, and Midnight released her knockout pheromones, trying to stop the match. But it was too late. Todoroki threw the largest barrage of ice and fire that Izuku had ever seen, and Izuku used his grapple gun to launch himself at Todoroki at full speed. That's it, Todoroki, shouted Izuku. Give me everything you've got. Todoroki absently felt a small sense of relief well up inside him. I see now, Midoriya, he thought. I see what you wanted to do. Thank you. The explosion completely shook the foundations of the stadium. Midnight and Cementos were blown away. Debris and wreckage flew in every direction as people ducked in cover. Not even the VIP box was safe from the shockwave. Good lord, Izuku, Alfred shouted, shielding himself from the blast with his arm. Bruce couldn't take his eyes off the ring, though it was completely obstructed by smoke and debris. Fear began to creep into his heart as he searched desperately for Izuku. Finally the smoke and steam began to dissipate in the wind. People craned their necks in all directions trying to see the victor, or to see if anyone was even still alive. There he is, shouted the long-haired man. Slumped against the wall of the stadium was Izuku, unconscious in a crumpled heap. There was a wave of concerned voices and screams of fear at the sight of him. Midoriya is dot 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 out of bounds, said Midnight, shaken. Todoroki is this year's sports festival champion. The crowd around them erupted in cheers. Todoroki simply stood there, staring at the broken image of his classmate. When a man in a black suit jumped from the bleacher wall separating the audience and into the stadium, landing next to Izuku. He stooped down, scooping him up into his arms, and ran off down the hallway leading to the preparation rooms. Todoroki left the destroyed ring as Cementus, and the cleanup bots went to work. Still shocked by the outcome of the match, Todoroki barely noticed the person waiting for him at the end of the hallway. What's the matter? said Endeavor smugly. Not going to tell me to get lost. Todoroki ignored him. You need to learn to control your left side, Endeavor continued. It's dangerous to release so much energy like that but I'm glad you're finally seeing reason. Now that you're through with your childish rebellion, we can get back to what's important. He stuck his hand out for Todoroki to shake. Once you graduate, you'll work by my side. I'll lead you down the path of the mighty Shoto. I haven't abandoned anything. Endeavor cocked his head, confused. What do you mean? Todoroki was looking at his left hand, almost in curiosity. You're a fool to think my feelings can be so easily reversed. Instead, out there, for that one moment, I forgot all about you. Whether that's a good or bad thing, I don't know. Maybe I don't need you. With that, Todoroki walked past his stunned father and back to the preparation room. Fight on. The sky was dark with clouds and rain, pouring down on the solemn procession below. People dressed from head to toe in black, gathering around to pay respects to the slim tombstone, representing all that was left on this earth of Katsuki Bakugu. The parents of the young Bakugu stood silently by the grave, thanking those who came to pray for their son's spirit for fortune in his next life, and that he may finally find rest. Izuku had strongly considered not going to the funeral of his friend. It was his fault that the villain who killed him had escaped. News about Izuku or All Might's involvement in the attack had not reached the media. He had assumed that since no one had seen All Might rescue him from the villain, that he simply had escaped the hero's pursuit before managing to get himself cornered by the other heroes. He figured that since Izuku knew about his secret, he wanted to keep him away from the press at all costs. It continuously played in his head, as if on a loop. He had caused the villain to get away from All Might. If he hadn't had grabbed onto him as he jumped away, the creature would have been in police custody already. How was he supposed to live with this? With himself, Izuku. Izuku was brought back to the present by Bakugu's mother. He had reached the front of the viewing line without even realizing it. Mrs. Bakugu, said Izuku. Thank you for coming, Izuku, said Mrs. Bakugu. I know that you and he weren't exactly friends in the end. He was always picking on you. But I had hoped one day he would. That you two could be friends again. She finished, choking up. Bakugu's mother was a strong woman. 
Although she tried not to show it, Izuku could see the heartbreak in her eyes. It made his stomach twist even more. He hung his head to avoid her gaze. I'm sorry, he said, his voice cracking. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault, she said. Izuku could feel his stomach retching inside of him. He didn't know how much more of this he could take. I swear to you, said Izuku finally. I'm going to become a hero, and when I do, I will find the monster who did this. Oh, Izuku, he felt a hand placed on his shoulder. He looked up, but jumped back in startled surprise. Mrs. Bakugu was gone. Instead, she was replaced by the sickly, withered form of All Might. Some villains can't be beaten without a quirk. Young man, he said, his voice garbled and distorted. He opened his wide gaping mouth, and a foul, green substance began to spew from his maw. It quickly wrapped itself around Izuku, covering his mouth to prevent him from screaming. Don't worry kid, said the distorted voice, the voice of the sludge villain. You can still be my hero. His wicked laughter rang out throughout his mind. He felt as if it would crack in two. He struggled to break free, but it was useless. He was suffocating. Please, he tried to cry out. Someone help me. The sludge drifted away, and he found himself staring at his reflection. But it was different than what he was used to. He was wearing a red suit, a golden cape, and a black domino mask. He heard a cry in the distance. Izuku. A crater opened beneath him. He began to fall. He reached for his utility belt, but nothing was there. The cries continued to ring out. Izuku. Still he fell, his voice caught in his throat, preventing his screams, falling deeper and deeper into the darkness. Izuku. Izuku gasped, awaking from his dream with a start. He lay in the hospital bed in Recovery Girls Trauma Center. His arms, legs and hands were wrapped up and bandaged heavily. He was shivering, not from cold, but from the pain of his injuries. He struggled to sit up, but something was holding him down. He turned to see Bruce gently holding him back, keeping him from moving further. Both Bruce and Alfred were standing beside Izuku. Thank God, said Alfred. You had us worried, young man. How long was I out? Asked Izuku groggily. At least 30 minutes, said Recovery Girl, standing at the edge of his bed. The bones in your right arm were shattered, she said solemnly, as were the fingers in both your hands. Your arms, face and torso have suffered severe third-degree burns, and you have destroyed roughly 20% of your outer epidermal layer from the explosions. Your body will never be the same as it was before. Where do you want to start? Asked Alfred, rolling up his sleeves. The most important thing right now is to remove the broken bone fragments in his limbs or they will get stuck in his joints, replied Recovery Girl. After that, we'll focus on healing. She sighed deeply and turned to Bruce. You lit a fire under this child and pushed him too hard, Bruce, she said. Look at what he's done to make you proud. I don't like it one bit. And you, she added back to Alfred. Why haven't you done anything about that? Among their vast arsenal, neither of them managed to carry with them the ability to listen to reason, replied Alfred. You and the boy are going too far, continued recovery girl. Don't you praise him for what he's done today, Bruce. Bruce didn't respond. They were interrupted by a large bang as the door behind them opened, with Yuraraka, Ida, Minta and Tsuyu piling into the room with a loud midoriya. Are you okay? said Yuraraka worriedly. She paused in surprise seeing Alfred and Bruce. Oh, hello again, Miss Yuraraka, said Alfred pleasantly. Hello, Alfred, she said, bowing. And it's nice to meet you, sir, she added, bowing to Bruce as well. He nodded, but said nothing. He's in no state for visitors, said recovery girl. Hey guys, everyone turned back to face Izuku. Shouldn't you be attending the award ceremony? He said weakly. The stage was far too damaged, said Ida. They're taking a break to repair it before the ceremony. That match was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life, Midwaria, said Maita. What hero agency would want someone who hurts themselves like that? I think you're rubbing salt in the wounds, said Tsuyu. You're much too noisy, said Recovery Girl, hurting them out of the room. I know you're worried, but we have to prepare for surgery. Surgery? They all shouted in unison again. They all continued to ask questions about Izuku's condition as Recovery Girl rushed them out the door. Izuku heard one final sad ribbit from Tsuyu before the door closed to silence. Alfred and Recovery Girl went into the back room to scrub up, leaving Bruce and Izuku alone. I'm sorry, said Izuku, breaking the long silence between them. For what? asked Bruce. I thought I could do it, said Izuku, tears welling in his eyes. If I had shut up, not said anything. You saw your classmates suffering and you acted in a way you thought best would help him, said Bruce. And in doing so, you lost the tournament, but you succeeded where it truly counts. Izuku turned away. All Might was right, he said sadly. Some people can't be beaten without a quirk. You still believe that? asked Bruce. After all this time, 
I don't know, said Izuku, before Bruce could reply. Recovery girl and Alfred returned and shooed him out the door so they could perform Izuku's surgery. Yuraraka, Ida, Minta and Tsuyu were walking back to the stadium. They had finished the repairs to the stadium from Izuku and Todoroki's match, and they would be starting award ceremony soon. Yuraraka was withdrawn and distant, not speaking the entire way. She had never been so worried about Izuku as she was now. He had hurt himself so much during the battle to keep up with Todoroki. She had seen him do so many amazing things, but this was the first time she had seen him lose and get hurt so badly in the process. Tsuyu seemed to notice Yuraraka's demeanor. Are you still worried about Midoriya? She asked. Yuraraka nodded. She said she had to perform surgery. The very thought of what that meant filled her with dread. What if the damage was permanent and they had to send him home? Recovery girl is the best, said Maita. You've got nothing to worry about. That's right, said Ida. I'm sure she will take great care of him. He will eat a paused, reaching into his pocket. It was his phone. His mother was calling him. Please excuse me, he said, walking away. Hello, mom, said Ida. I hate to tell you this, but I lost my match. No, son, I'm not calling about that, said his mother. She sounded almost frantic. I mean, I'm sorry, but Tenya, please listen carefully. What's wrong? Said Ida, alarmed. It's your brother, his mother replied, her voice breaking. A villain got Tensei. Ida let the phone drop from his ear. He vaguely heard his mother calling his name from the earpiece. His world was crumbling. His brother was one of the top heroes in the profession. To him, he could do no wrong. Sure, he knew he was human, but he always thought of Tensei as unbeatable. To think that he could be hurt, or worse, was unfathomable to Ida. Who could have done this to him? Standing high upon the rooftops, glaring down upon the scene below him with an eerie smile, the hero killer Stain licked the turbo hero's blood from his chipped blade. He wasn't sure if the hero was dead or not. He didn't have the time to check before he heard the police sirens draw closer. It didn't matter. His wounds were grievous, and Stain's blows struck true. If he survived the night, there was a high chance that the hero would no longer be able to walk, much less use his quirk. You haven't even noticed it, have you? He growled, watching as the emergency technicians worked to stabilize their patient. This warped society mired by hypocrisy and vanity. That's fine, I'll open your eyes, heroes. You will see the world that you have created. Suddenly, Stain thrust his sword behind him. Someone was trying to sneak up on him. It would be their last act on this earth. But the tip of his sword did not bury itself in flesh, but in a strange purple and black smoke. Please remain calm, said the smoke, two jagged yellow eyes staring down at him. We are of the same mind. I have been searching for you, hero killer Stain. I heard of your exploits and wanted to meet you in person. I think you'll be interested in what I have to offer. Bruce Wayne stood in the hallway outside the medical center. Alfred and Recovery Girl were still performing Midoriya's surgery. He couldn't help but feel a slight sense of nostalgia considering how many times he was patched up by Alfred and Dr. Leslie Tompkins. Every time they would lecture him about pushing himself beyond his limits, and each time he would return in worse shape than before. His back was broken by Bane. His mind nearly damaged beyond repair by hush, overexposure to joker venom or fear gas, he had been through a lot. But no matter how hurt he was, no matter how long it took him to recover, it never stopped him. A true hero never stopped. And he knew Midoriya would never stop either. Bruce. Came a voice from down the hall. He turned to see the thin form of All Might running towards him. A coughing fit overtook him. And Bruce handed him a handkerchief while he waited for him to regain composure. Thank you, said All Might. How is he? He'll live, said Bruce. Alfred and Recovery Girl are working on him now. That's good, All Might replied. A small, awkward silence stretched between them. I'm sorry, said All Might quietly. Pardon, I'm sorry, All Might repeated, exasperated. I said it, okay. I'm sorry. You obviously saw something in Midoriya that I didn't. Your instincts were right. You were right. Okay, I usually am, said Bruce. But that's not what's bothering you. All Might sighed deeply, leaning against the wall next to Bruce. Ever since all for one, ever since my injury, I've been losing sight of things. Important things that I never should have forgotten, he said. I feel like I've forgotten what it truly means to be a hero. On top of that, the fight with Namu in the League of Villains has reduced my time to only about an hour. The symbol of peace, the man who keeps society together, is literally on borrowed time. And now, I don't know what to do. About one for all, said Bruce. All Might nodded, but said nothing. He pulled a silver medallion from his pocket. The closing ceremonies are over, said All Might. I wanted to bring this to him myself. I never would have thought that he could have made it this far. His voice was strange. It was a mix between pride and regret. You already know who the right choice is, Tashinori, said Bruce. He hates me, Bruce, said All Might. 
He won't accept, maybe not, but he's had other people telling him what he can and can't do, or should or shouldn't accept his entire life, said Bruce. Why don't you let him make that choice for himself? All Might didn't answer right away. He continued to stare at the medallion, remember a time from his youth. It felt like an eternity ago, when Nana Shimura took a chance on him, another quirkless weakling, and helped to shape him into the hero he is today. The same situation from all those years ago crossed his path, and he let it fumble through his fingers. He lost sight of what's important. He wondered if she could see him now if she would be proud or ashamed. Why are you helping me, Bruce? Asked All Might. We aren't exactly friends. We're not exactly enemies either, Tashinori, said Bruce, turning to walk away. Before you go, I have to tell you something, said All Might, remembering suddenly. Endeavor let it slip about Jason to Midoriya before the match. I tried to stop him, but I don't know how much he said before I got there. I'm sorry, Bruce. Bruce stopped, pondering All Might's words. After a minute or so, he sighed deeply. Learning about Jason's fate was inevitable, he said. But it does complicate things. Izuku lay in bed as Alfred and Recovery Girl finished their healing. After the surgery, the healing process took no time at all, thanks to their quirks, but it left Izuku feeling drained and exhausted. His arm and fingers were no longer burned or broken, but had left several scars. His hand was also gnarled and crooked from the damage of the battle. Recovery Girl said that would be a reminder to him to keep him from overdoing it in the future. Alfred stayed by his side after Recovery Girl left to attend to other matters. A long silence stretched between them before Alfred cleared his throat. Penny for your thoughts, Master Midoriya? He asked. Izuku didn't answer, looking away. Alfred sighed. You mustn't be so hard on yourself, Izuku, he said. You did so well, you should be proud. I failed, Alfred, said Izuku. And it's my own damn fault I did. I know I could have beaten him, but I had to get involved. You were already involved, said Alfred. And intervening where it is not necessarily your place to is part of what being a hero is about. You did what you thought was necessary. Master Bruce even feels so. I tried so hard, Alfred, said Izuku. I couldn't stop the League of Villains, I couldn't beat the Namu, and I couldn't beat Todoroki. How can I possibly live up to the Batman legacy? Master Midoriya, everyone suffers defeat, said Alfred. No one is exempt from this, not even the Batman. Izuku didn't reply and silence stretched between them again for ten minutes before there was a knock at the door. Come in, said Alfred, before Izuku could object. Izuku groaned as he saw the tall, thin image of All Might enter the room from the corner of his eye. Hello, All Might said, shuffling in awkwardly. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, Master Yagi, said Alfred pleasantly. I should really check on Master Bruce. Perhaps you two can catch up a bit. He abruptly stood and left the room, leaving the two of them alone. Young Midoriya, said All Might. How are you feeling? Izuku didn't answer. He had nothing to say to him. All Might cleared his throat and pulled a silver medallion from his pocket. The awards ceremony is over, and I wanted to bring you this, he said, offering it to Izuku. I don't want it, said Izuku flatly. All Might hesitated slightly. You did very well out there, he said. It's something to be proud of, really, how far you made it, considering All Might stopped himself. But it was too late. Izuku finally turned to him, an intense glare meeting his eyes. Considering I don't have a quirk. He snarled. That's not what I all might began hastily. So you came here to gloat, is that it? Izuku continued. Came to tell me you were right all along. Some villains just can't be beaten without a quirk, right? I didn't. Don't you get it? Shouted Izuku. I don't want anything to do with you. No matter how clear I make that, you still keep coming back. Do you find it funny? God, no, said All Might. Are you still trying to get me to quit? Izuku continued, sitting up, even though it pained him to do so. To give up on my unrealistic dreams. Young Midoriya, please, All Might said, trying to calm him down. I'm just trying to help. I don't want your help. Izuku screamed, tears streaming down his eyes. I don't need you. I don't need anyone. I can be a hero on my own. Get out. Get out. All Might obliged, putting his medal on Izuku's bed and exiting the room. He could still hear Izuku's yells as he left the room. His heart was pounding. He supposed he should have expected this kind of reaction, but it still pained him. It was his fault, the damage done, the reason he was pushing himself so hard, everything because of what he said to him. He had been fighting it for months now, but he could no longer deny what was right in front of him. Midoriya was worthy, more worthy than he could have ever imagined, and he screwed up his chance to pass on his legacy. He had to make this right, somehow. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 4. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.